In Manx and Canyon, the construction industry was booming, which of course means that an old man was single-handedly building electric wind turbines on the hill and huge sandstone watchtowers astride the base approach. Being stonkingly rich these days, Chocolate Baron Nuke could afford a little opulence. The locals didn't like it. The canyon was raided by the reavers and pirates of the outlands more than ever. With harpoons now shooting down from the towers at great distances, all this did little to disturb the day and night academia in Izumi's office. The secrets of the ancients began to emerge from the texts like hashish emerging from a hiver's latrine. The mess coalesced, and soon it was worth putting your hand in to try your luck. What I'm trying and failing to say is that Nuke got his little invention up and running on Azumi's roof. A big copper boiler with all manner of pipes, gauges and heating elements. This brown machine was the green machine. My man, the drug leaves, Nuke called out. Wadston ferries Nuke some dried hemp stalks. My man, the mank, was the next order. Wadston ferried Nuke a bucket of what passed for water around those parts. My man, the hype, was the final command. Uh, my prince, I believe in you, Wadston offered as Nuke started feeding leaves into the top of the boiler. Harder, my man. You can do it, my prince. Live your dreams. I'm doing it, my man. It's really happening. I can't believe it. Get that water shit in there. Hydrate the fucking fire and shit. What was the next step? Gotta turn this. My man, I can't hear you. My prince, you're amazing. I've never seen anything like it. Keep it up, my prince. I won't stop till I reach the top, Nuke exclaimed. He was talking about filling up the boiler, of course, but Azumi couldn't help but wonder just what was happening upstairs. Of course, it was nothing underhanded at all, just some good old-fashioned homebrew drug production. Did it work? To find out, Nuke happily volunteered to test the first batch that came out. According to the prince's own account of events, he then spent several hours frolicking with animals in the long grass, excitedly recounting how one Professor Oak had a very special present for him. Oak? That's a tree on Earth. Has he been secretly reading my science books? He's... he always surprises me, Izumi wistfully commented to herself. If only she knew. In all, Nuke had a great couple of weeks, stirring the hashish pot in a constant daze while Wadston kept him as close to alive as it is comfortable to be. What was everyone else up to? Time off, really, with plenty of lying around, a few folk trying their hand at the farming of both green and brown, and if you got bored, you could always go out and start playing with the corpses outside the gate. If that wasn't enough for you, you could always mine and process tin for Rick, who was locked in his shed the whole time working on his little tin models. It was quite the hobby, but it had become rather suspicious. Rick kept refusing to open the door, demanding that all material be thrown in through the window. And he started adding to the list of materials things that surely weren't relevant. Leather, glass, beads, and most suspicious of all, a sample of the Funtime corpses. This was all eventually organized, as his new skeleton friend Agnew was good at keeping secrets, and no one believed Els when he told the others what Rick was doing in there. What was he doing? It's hard to explain. In fact, there is no particular explanation at all, so I'll just have to give it to you straight. Rick had given himself a little makeover. What the fuck? Nuke screamed. This green is fucking mental! He looks like... like... A human! Izumi exclaimed. Hello, friendos. It's ya boy, Red Rick. Guess I'm like Pink Dink or something now. Rick was sporting an entire body of fleshy... flesh. Bald head, bulky physique, beady brown eyes, and beady is very much the right term for it. He was... He's a human! As Aya helpfully pointed out. More like new man, Els said. Yep, that's right, Rick nodded. Coin slot, are you... do you even have a coin slot? Forget I said anything, Nuke memorably said. Rick, do you want to explain yourself? Izumi asked. Nope, this is me now. Still got the stick in here somewhere, so I don't want to hear any back talk. Skeleton look wasn't doing me no good, you know. Got a lot of baggage, that shit. So just shut up 
Now let's go leak bodily fluids like a load of genuine fleshies, huh? Man, you freak me out, Nuke said, placing and then immediately removing a hand from Rick's icy cold shoulder meat. But hey, let's leak our fluids with the best of them. Man, you biologicals got a lot of magic in you, you know. Magic? Isaiah said. Wait, you, the skeleton wizard, he shouted, jumping at Rick with outstretched arms. I knew you were real. Same. Damn, I was getting a lot of hugs before, if you know what I'm saying. Rick, you are the answer to the prophecy, Isaiah claimed, but Nuke dragged him away. Don't worry, it's because basically you're a moving corpse, he's got all excited and shit. It's a Shek thing, man, he said. My dad got blazed and told me only a skeleton wizard would save the Empire or something, so that's that. Kind of relevant, actually, because we got some work to do. It's drug running time. Bad Green, I need your goat. Follow me. Never. Why do you need my ass? Gustafsson complained. Because, man, I need to smuggle drugs with your ass. Ah, to contribute to the ascension of a worthy prince would bring pleasure to any ass. Please, Prince Gustafsson, stop talking, Izumi demanded. Never! My ass does not quit, so why should I? This sort of thing carried on for a long time, but the main takeaway is that firstly, Gustafsson's goat had a very funny name, and secondly, bags of hashish were strapped around it for transit back to the imperial capital at Heft. Indeed, it technically wasn't illegal for a goat to possess narcotics, so the scheme was surely watertight. This meant that at long last, Nuke was going home. As a reminder, his plan was to blaze his dad halfway to the big fiery thing in the sky, and then use his compromised state to get Nuke back to being heir, and perhaps a little more than that. Let's see how that goes. Crossing into the Empire's core lands near Heng brought a nostalgic reminder of the land Nuke had left. Gangs of hopeless slavers were all over the place, trying to beat the guild into a valuable pulp. For Rick, the pulp was already sorted, but nonetheless, the slavers were not long for this world. Is this fucking shit, exactly this shit that messes everything up? Nuke said. If his majesty allows it, perhaps we'll finally get a chance to avenge your foul treatment, my prince. Wadston said. Even if he doesn't, man. Green Rebellion's brewing. I can smell it. And it's not just ass, either. Well said, my prince. Eventually, they all made it to Heft. And on a good day, too, for it wasn't even under siege by skimmers. They walked right on through the huge city gates with no attention to... Sigh, Gustafsson's ass's bulging bags. The guild was back in town, and all the members who hadn't seen the old HQ could marvel at the history contained within. Skimmer stakes rotting in crawling wooden boxes, pages of old light novels pasted on the walls, the characters within staring out with flushed cheeks, and who could miss the strange hole in the ground that dominated the main living area, and the pump that spat out sloppy brown hydration medium with irregular belching wheezes. Truly, it was the best of times. Nuke waded through the mess to get to his old wardrobe, from which he produced his noble attire. He threw aside his cool leather and chainmail getup and bathed in the hydration medium, although the term bathed implies this increased his level of hygiene, which is admittedly misleading. Then, with a few fine threads and a stroke of a skimmer-tooth comb, he was about as dapper as an emperor in waiting can get. He asked Gustafsson to hand the goat and its cargo over. He probably said something hilarious like, surrender your ass to me, but these vital details were lost to history, I'm afraid. Then he marched out into the street, with ass in tow, and made the fateful walk up to the Imperial Palace. Seeing him, the guards quickly stowed away their valuables and blocked the doors. Stop right there, my lord, you were not summoned. I was actually man, go tell dad I've brought him the secret of the skeleton wizard. What the fuck are you talking about, my lord? Just do it! Alright, if you let me stroke your goat there. Man, if you knew its name, that would be so funny. Ah, classic. Go on then. The deal was undertaken, and a samurai soon returned from upstairs. Yeah, he kept repeating skeleton wizard, and started banging the arm of the throne. I think this might actually be something, he reported. 
Thus, Nuke was allowed to proceed up to the very heart of the Empire, wreathed in a strange aromatic smoke. He waved his way through it towards the throne. Dad, what's all this shit? he asked. Tengu was slumped on the throne with a charred lump of something in his hand. Green boy! Green boy, is that you? It's your only child, whose name I leave to you to remember. What's with this smoke? We ran out. Nothing left. Had to smoke this weird-ass bread. Golden brown, they called it. Don't do shit for me, boy. Didn't do shit. It's like waking up at high noon, this shit. It's like finding out your sister stole your music box, this fucking shit. Green boy, gotta save me. I'll give you anything. How about everything? Yeah, I got one of those. It's yours, green boy. Well, that's all I needed to hear. You, write that down, Nuke said to a guard in the corner. Oh, and then close your eyes. I'm about to reveal what I've hidden in my... Oh, forget it, you need to know the context for it to be funny. Drugs time! Finally, all of Nuke's hard work, which may or may not have actually been performed by Nuke himself, was going to pay off. One by one, he revealed blocks of cool, crumbly hashish, drawing desperate pants from the Emperor. By the time everything was unloaded, Tengu's throne was positively fortified with premium mank-boiled green. Ocrins, drooping! Earlobes, Tengu whispered. He reached out and stroked his hand across the epic supply. It crumbled against his fingers, the pieces dancing a gentle invitation as they fell away. He stood from the throne, opened his arms, and swung face down into the mighty pile. It exploded everywhere, kicking up a mucky fog that shooed the brown smoke away. This was truly a beautiful metaphor. When it cleared, Tengu was standing again, perfectly still. He looked at Nuke. Nuke, it's you. Dad, you feel inhuman? Man, I ain't felt this human in a long time, he said, grabbing Nuke for a fragrant hug. My boy's here, and I'm back on top. Yeah, baby, come on, let's get some air and shit. Nuke and Tengu went down to the dining hall, where the open doors brought in a refreshing desert night wind. There, Nuke had quite the tale to tell. And so in the end, I was like, suck my sword, and they all laughed, and then I killed them all, Nuke was saying. I don't think the tale he told was quite the same one as I've recounted so far, but I suppose it hit a few similar beats. And then the Goat King opened his mouth, and there he was, standing in the flames, the bilge maker himself, Seperon. Okay, I don't know what story he told, but to be fair, he was caught in that hashish explosion too. Tengu asked to meet the guild Nuke was talking about, and they were summoned up to the palace also. Damn, boy, you got a real freak show here, Tengu commented. Your Majesty, you honor us with your praise, Isaiah said. We are indeed rather aside from the usual path life might ask of us, but that is precisely why we have come so much further along than those less fortunate. This is my corpse carrier, he's the Prince of the Shek Kingdom, Isaiah, Nuke explained. I don't believe it! My boar making links like a smith! Prince Isaiah, you've done my boar right, and so you've done me and your mama right. This is the good stuff that the good stuff gives you, you know! I will ponder these surely wise words, Isaiah said. And Dad, this is Izzy, Nuke said, suddenly clamming up. Your Majesty, Your Highness, I am forever in your debt. Please excuse my humble presence, Izumi groveled. Ah, who's she then, your girlfriend? Tengu asked. The guild was silent. The atmosphere was as delicate as a brick of green. Uh, yeah. Nuke managed to say. Everybody was uproariously cheering, or sneering, on the inside, I expect. But in action, all that happened was Azumi stared at Nuke in shock. Nuke! I mean, your majesty, I wouldn't dare! She blurted out. Dare away! Brought time this kid got a proper relationship! <laughs> oh, uh, did he not? Uh... Nope! Real loser, this guy! Dad, please, I was busy and I had commitments, Nuke said. 
Yeah, commitments to your goddamn Japanese picture books. <laughs> At least you finally got it out of your system, huh? Sure, totally. Good. That's no hobby for a 20-year-old man to be obsessing over. What? You're 20? Izumi gasped. Yeah, so what? Nuke shot back. But you look... you look like... your eyes and your face. <laughs> Don't worry about that, my child. Tengu laughed. He's been on the blazing blocks too long, little dreg. Screws you up in the face after a while. Yeah, he looks goddamn 35 at least. Get goggles, man. The goggles, they do everything. So wait, how old are you? Nuke asked Izumi. Uh, a little older than that. I'm 251. Els added. You all require fishman juice, Gustafsson reminded them. What a bunch you are, Tengu said. If you're done introducing yourself to each other, let's get some sit down and see what's what. There was some clarification of the real story to Tengu at this point, and as he heard it, he could not help but be both impressed and humbled. Shit, Nuke. I've been a real deadbeat. And you saved me. You're a superhero. Green boy, he said. I wanted to do it, most of the time. I mean, what I really want is to be back in and stuff. I want to be the prince, you know? You are the prince. Consider your delightful crimes absolved, Tengu shouted, drawing a cheer from the guild. Damn, my boy, my only boy, how could I be so blind? I ain't never gonna give you up, never gonna let you down. Not this shit again, Rick commented. What the? That's a skeleton voice you got, man, Tengu said, scrambling over to Rick. Yep, deal with it, big shot, or deal with my stick. Dad, do you know about the skeleton wizard? Nuke said. Skeleton wizard? What the fuck is that? Oh, it don't matter. Anyway, this robo's a new man. It's a thing now, I don't know. New man? That's some real shit. With a get up like that, you could sneak right into the Holy Phoenix's 10 story latrine and give him a stick to remember. Yeah, uh, what's the deal with all that Holy Nation stuff? It's bad, son. It's real bad. Can't take it. Those freaks want to burn everything. My captains ain't got nowhere in a year, and I don't even know what happened since the green ran out. Nuke, it's like, you said you wanted to be a prince. Being a prince comes with a lot of shit, and this right here is just it. Holy nation's gonna be grinding us down day in, day out, until either us or Ocran sorts it out. You've proven to me that you have enough drugs to solve any problem. So I gotta ask it to you again. Help me, Nuke. You're my only hope. If you give me the power, I'll give you the peace, man, Nuke said. You got all the power you need. But you'll have mine as well. Ruling Prince Nuke Tashino is here, and this empire's gonna get behind him no matter what, Tengu declared. This declaration was made real without delay. Messengers ran off to inform the whole empire that Nuke was officially back on the books, nay, on the cover of the book. The green boy was the green prince, in line to be the green emperor. But Tengu was right. The Holy Nation, whom the guild have successfully avoided thus far, had armies ready to wipe the world clean of all those they hated. Skeletons, Hivers, Shek, and any human who didn't shine as bright as Okran's icy light or couldn't grow a decent beard in short order. Basically, they hated everything. You know how that goes, these guys show up in all kinds of places. Right next to Nuke's empire was the wrong place, and right as he was planning to spread his poorly defined drugs-based utopia to the world was the wrong time. Something had to be done. Thus was the next chapter in Nuke's tale decided upon. However, there is one little detail of this royal reunion worth explaining. After everyone was returning back to the guild's properties, Izumi dallied for a moment in the throne room, admiring the mess the hashbash had left. There was the throne, empty. She walked up to it, saw that no one was around, and took a seat. It wasn't that comfy, she thought, but then she suddenly had a very important revelation. She was the actual confirmed girlfriend of the second most powerful noble in the empire. She, poor little Azumi, strung along for months by a man significantly younger than her as it turned out, was in line to be empress. What would the world of the Green Emperor and the Greasy Empress be like? Let's see where this dream takes us. So there's this place, all that stuff, this bit. 
I don't know, any ideas? Nuke said. He was sitting over a map of the Holy Nation's territory, and had been freshly tasked by his father to do something about these murderous neighbours. You're the prince. What does your instinct tell you? Sandor said. This is a crisis. In ancient texts, they made dealing with this stuff so easy. I mean, say for example you tripped over and landed on top of your senpai friend in a compromising position. With their sophisticated techniques, they flowed like water and followed the situation through as if it was planned from the very beginning. See pages 13 to 27 on the wall there. Everyone took a look, but it didn't explain all that much. Why are her eyes like love hearts? Els asked. Because she adapted to the situation and came out on top, Nuke explained. But so soon after... She must be faking it, Izumi concluded. Then we too shall fake it, Nuke declared. If those holy hogs want to kill us so much, then we have to accept that fact and just kill them first. Flow out of the crisis real cool. That's what you're taking away from this uh, literature. Are we going to have love heart eyes? Els asked. Yes, Charlie, my boy, we're going to go pay those fugs a visit and see our little predicament through to its most satisfying conclusion, Nuke said. Man, what is all this shit? Rick said. He was staring closely at the drawings and didn't seem impressed. Biological's got all this shit they gotta do. What do you think, Agnew? <laughs> Agnew commented. He wants to come out on top. Els translated. Then let's cease burning our eyes on this fascinating study of human anatomy and get marching, Isaiah said, and soon enough they were burning their eyes with the sandy desert wind instead, not to mention burning calories as they ran frantically across the expansive skimmer ranges west of the city. They were heading towards Bast, the hotly contested border with the Holy Nation. They arrived in record time, on account of the horde of skimmers that chased them all the way there. I don't think they're backing off, Elena huffed. Must be our smell. My prince, is it your supply? Wadston asked. Man, don't even go there. I ain't leaving my stash. I'd rather leave you. Keep bloody running. We've got more legs than them, altogether, so we're faster. It's science. With such high-quality athletics coaching, how could they lose? I suppose the reason the skimmers started catching up must have been that small millipedes moving at the speed of light were bumping into them from behind. But as the horde got close, the oily sands of Bast revealed salvation. For the Emperor! A voice called. From behind a ridge, a company of United City soldiers burst into view and charged the skimmers with outstretched spears. Exactly according to my plan, Nuke panted, waving for everyone to turn around. It was truly a cunning ambush, and the skimmers were so convinced by the guild's panicked flight that they fell for the lucky mastermind's ploy. The horde was very soon no more. Prince Tashino, you're safe, the samurai captain said, quick to bow to his better. Well, you're like not being a piece of shit to me, Nuke said. Never, my prince. The Emperor's command is law. Now that we have given service to you, we can die without regret, no matter what happens. <laughs> These fellows would make good shek, Isaiah remarked. Well, you know, carry on. No further orders, chaps. Make sure all these rocks and stuff don't, you know, militarize our... Uh... Fall out, Nuke ordered. The samurai saluted and obeyed without question which was a shame, because some questions would have really helped. The guild carried on westwards, and soon found the much-talked-about border with the Holy Nation. There, this war, which had seemed so distant to Nuke in his life so far, was really happening. Holy Nation warriors were attacking a band of samurai, and into this messy brawl did the guild descend. Didn't take more than a glance at their shecky, ivory, roboty, womanly, dark, skinly composition to know which side they were on. And didn't take long for these unholy abominations to prove themselves a little stronger than the Holy Nation's priests would have folk believe. Yes, that is a very polite way of saying that all the holy troops got killed. Night had fallen, 
but that made it the perfect time to carry on into the Naish in secret. Not that this means they did keep it a secret. I can feel them hitting my hand when I hold it up, seriously, Nuke was saying. Nuke, those are sand flies, they're laying eggs in your hand, Izumi said. Oi, is that a bunch of bloody toffs I hear out there? A voice said. A Holy Nation patrol fell upon them in the darkness, but the Thousand Guardians were more than able to best their rank and file. Only their leaders proved any challenge, decked out in metal armor. Man, take me to your leader or something, I need this sorted, Nuke said to a so-called High Paladin. Oh, fuck off, you freak of nature! This is holy ground, and you're stinking it up like a hiver in heat, was the answer. He sounds like the nasty lady at home, Els noted. What's this fucking egg saying? You fucking degenerates been breeding with rocks again, the paladin raged, but a blow finally knocked him down. Leave the egg out of this, you tyrant, Isaiah said before finishing the job. So, what is the plan here? Izumi asked. Are we just going to kill them all one by one? Just looking. Needed to see what all this stuff was. And it's real, at least. Kind of didn't realize that before, Nuke said. I was going to suggest a detour. Holy Nation has a university up in the mountains. I'll get us in there, if you want. Sounded like as good a place as any to check out. At daybreak, they crossed a large valley full of crusty trees, stopping to fend off more holy patrols along the way, and eventually reached the steep, rocky western slope. There, Azumi led them up some narrow paths towards the top. Miss Azumi, have you done this before? Watson asked. Yeah, paid these guys a visit once, but it was a mistake. Only good thing that came out of all that shit was meeting Jazz in a damn work camp. Well, this time we killed all the patrols, so I guess me being a woman won't be such a problem. Oh, Miss Azumi, I'm so sorry you had to go through any of that. Focus on making those idiots sorry for it, that's what I prefer. A fine idea. After a grueling climb, there really was a whole load of stuff atop the mountain. It was World's End University, a hub for academics similar to Black Scratch. And while it was in the Holy Nation, it was packed with all kinds of unholy individuals. Has to be so high up, so the patrols don't bother coming to check who's here, Azumi explained. And who is here? Nuke asked. Tech hunters, my people. Leave this to me. Izumi walked over to the gate guards. The gate was flanked by statues of the High Phoenix, the nation's supreme leader. Show me your holy book, woman, the guard growled. Fuck off, Izumi shot back. All right, that's the password. What can I do for you? I'm Izumi. I'm here for academic purposes. Oh yeah, Izumi, I read your stuff. Something about mirrors not being real because of her eyes or something. It was highly speculative. Just let me in, please. I've got to speak with the professors. Got an Imperial Noble in your little group. Can't really be having that, my love. No, he's fine. He has to come in too. He's my... boy. Your son? Uh, I'm not that old, you know. All right. Sounds like you got some fucking baggage there, mate. Just get in then. In they just got, and inside they could chill out in this nice little university town where everyone was high all the time, on account of its altitude, of course. Even higher was the tall university building itself, into which Azumi plodded with Toy Boy Nuke in tow. The place was full of books, people reading the books, people talking about the books, and people writing new books. But these books only had words in them, and rarely were these words things like Onichan, Yamate, or Kimochi Nyan Nyan. Was it really correct to call them books then? Professor Nuke certainly had an opinion, as did a real professor, a skeleton named Eo. Greasy girl, you survived, she said. Yes, thank you, Professor. I just wanted to ask how things are going. Perfectly well. We have attained various relics of late from ruins in the Northwest. We're beginning to uncover some most fascinating details on the emergence of the Second Empire. Izzy, tell her. Nuke whispered. No, it's secret, get lost. No, I mean tell her about my thing. Oh, fuck. Professor, this is Professor Tashino from the Magsand Laboratory. I haven't heard of such an institution. It's new, known for the invention of brown bread. 
Oh, the Shecknip. Yes, that's quite fun, making their horns wiggle about. Yeah. Anyway, he's got his theory to present to you. It's called, uh, superluminal millipedes and their effect on long-distance endurance panicking. Well, that sounds like science, all right. I bet it's all true. Eo nodded. You must understand that with the academic circumstances the world found itself in, the standards were a little lower than you might be used to. In fact, after Azumi went through an extensive debate with the prof, she ran out to find Nuke with a look of glee on her face. They don't know shit, she reported. They think that the First Empire was destroyed by a tornado and that the Earth clans died of illness. They've got nothing on the degeneracy parasite. Nothing. It's like... They haven't even read the classics? Nuke offered. Exactly. I've bloody got them, Nuke. I'm gonna blow their fancy big university shit right out of the sky. And to clarify, is that a metaphor? I think so. Cool. There's just one thing we lack. They said they had data from somewhere in the Northwest. We need to get out there and swipe everything they might try to use. You really want to get this discovery all on you, huh? Why shouldn't I? Oh, no reason. Just needed something for if someone asks why we're screwing these guys over. Let's fucking do it. And that is why the guild set off the very next morning towards the west, leaving the Holy Nation and heading into the lands ruled by... Well, you'll see. From the mountaintop, one could see a huge lake shimmering on the horizon, and that is where the guild went to begin their search. Was it the right place? Clearly, it was because as they approached, they saw a gang of tech hunters with heavy gear preparing for an expedition of their own. Hey, excuse me, you guys working with Professor Eo? Izumi asked. We don't take amateurs. Go dust the books for a few years, the lot of you, the huge Shek leading the group replied. Izumi looked to Nuke, who knew exactly what to do. My good man, it's a pleasure to meet you, he said, offering the Shek a handshake. The Sheik accepted it after eyeing up Nuke's noble robe. Long way from the Empire, Lord. Wait, what the? The Sheik looked down at his hand and found Nuke had smuggled a lump of speckled brown sludge into it during the shake. Professor Eo won't be needing your services. I think we understand each other, Nuke said. The Sheik wanted to bark out a furious reply but the smell of that splodge on his hand was overpowering his senses. Shaking, as if resisting the movement, he brought it up to his mouth and sucked it in with a gasping gulp. His horns knocked the hat from his head. You're the Tashino Credit Management and Non-Consensual Private Healthcare Guilds in association with the Tashino Crustacean Core Private Security Consortium and the Future Girl Industry Semi-Professional Association of Archaeological Grudge Settlers and Ancient Quasi-Amateur Baking Enthusiasts now incorporating the Green Emperor Legal 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 Makes You Human Juice and Cuboids Factorium and the Better Red Than Dead Tincraft Museum. But you can call me Your Highness. Welcome aboard, chums. First hits free. Ask for ass if you want the good stuff. Thus, Eo's expedition fell in with the guild, and even shared their planned destination. At the north end of the big lake, there was a clifftop Second Empire ruin. Flying machines buzzed around its domed grey roof, and as the guild learned quickly, Iron Spider soldiers were guarding the way up to it. Seems like Azumi stepped in just in time to prevent her rivals getting a score as big as the Shun Run. Or maybe not. The guild set up camp outside while Sandor went up to scout the place out. Ground floor was empty, save for a trail of scrap and gone off food that snaked up the ramp to the second floor. Where was this enticing trail leading? Probably towards whatever was creating the intense stench of human meat. Yes. This ruin was a dud, and was being used as a fancy restaurant of sorts by the guild's old friends, the cannibals. Since it was getting dark, Nuke took everyone in to make a reservation. But what do you know, there was a disagreement over the contents of the evening's specials menu, and it all ended in tears. Sorry, I mean tears, as in rips, as in the guild got their swords out and made a well-diced dish of the cannibal clientele. Delicious, I'm sure but they stuck to their choco bread and steak come breakfast time. 
The place had contained a few valuables hoarded by the cannibals, but this victory was no blow to World's End University. In the morning then, they carried on further northwest. There was real hope of another astounding discovery, but really their journey carried on as it had began. Those cannibals were no anomaly. Their kind made killing travellers in these parts their bread and butter. Not at all literally, of course. This was much less of a problem than it had been during the guild's earlier trip to Deadfinger, realm of the majestic Goat King. The Thousand Guardians could kick your average scrawny cannibal about 20 meters with a good connection, and took a furious enjoyment in doing so. Hunting these little buggers is so exhilarating, Isaiah commented. Enforcer genes, man. They wake up, the fleshies shut down, you know, Rick said. What are these genes, Rick? Wait, first, why do you call them enforcers sometimes? Izumi asked. It's what they are, the horny ones. Not like you, Greaseball, but the Sheck. Called them enforcers since that's what they did back in version 2. Kicking field goals with fleshies was morning exercise. But I'm fleshy too, Els noted. Yeah, we kinda let you go. You ended up on their side, and damn, so did we. Helped the whole peace process along, having you point that shit out. I helped. Eggman, if we'd have had more freaks like you around, the world would be like 30% less on fire. The thrill of battle took the guild to an old town called Deadcat, the hub of the cannibal economy. This ruined shithole tucked away in a gully was the best place to get a fine cut of forearm or a hefty coal-fired rump soaked in a sweet urchin rum glaze. Prince Tashino, can we kill them? Please, please! Isaiah said. Oh, go on then, you scamp, Nuke said, and with a cheer, the Sheik ran off for more sport. This isn't really what I had in mind, Izumi said. Come on, let the guy have his fun. He'll be a teenager soon, then we'll wish he had the energy and spirit to go on a mad rampage. Let him enjoy his childhood. I suppose. Is that what you did when you were like, 12? Well, yeah, but only against Wardston. Was kind of trapped in the palace. Dad wouldn't let me go out and hunt. <laughs> Called them dregs, but I guess they ain't really. It wasn't the scum who ended up poor, turned out. And some of those poor dregs were quite lovely. Are you flirting? Maybe no. Correct. Thanks for not locking me up then. That's not what you said. All right, let's go have a shot at the cannibal, shall we? And everyone had a merry time taking out the cannibals. The leaders of the cannibal tribes were all present and were captured alive. As an intellectual treasure, they did little, but together they were worth a fortune in bounty payments back in the Empire, so the trip was a profitable one to be sure. Perhaps a little less human flesh would be consumed after all that too. It's all part of the Green Revolution, one supposes. After Deadcat, the crew wandered north, and finally got somewhere more academically fertile the mountainous northwestern reaches of the world, known as the Leviathan Coast. Why were they known as that? You must know the drill by now. Ockran's toenails! A Leviathan! Izumi gasped. There it was, a towering grey armoured Leviathan. It was around five floors tall, walking on four legs, but its rear legs were longer and thick as the tree tree, raising its rear end high into the sky. On its back was a huge shell like a turtle, and its head was like that of an ant, combing the ground for nibbles. Hey, sometimes you hit random on the machine, and you get a winner, Rick said. I've read about these things. People tried to hunt them, but guess it didn't work, given that all the locals ended up eating each other instead. Let's check it out. Probably guarding some ancient shit, right? Nuke said. Everyone advanced, the trodding leviathan paying them no heed. Up the coast beyond it, they found a second empire ruin, and took their chances breaking in to spend the night. Turned out to be one of the ones the old skeleton overlords really didn't want people getting into. It was packed with those security spiders who gave the guild an absolute hammering. No one died, and that was more than you can ever hope for really, so smiles all round. There were three issues though. Firstly, the loot was nothing worth swiping away from the university. 
Secondly, everyone could barely move for all the injuries the spiders had left them with. And thirdly, this building was a nighttime hangout for beak things. Yes, the attempt to rest was spoiled at 1am when hungry beaks on long necks reached in through the windows and started snapping. The freezing night wind didn't help either. The beak things were dealt with, but everyone was pained and miserable. Fuck it, Izzy. Those guys aren't gonna put up with this shit. We're safe, Nuke said. I think you're right. Sorry I've been so selfish. What are we even doing here? Let's get back to World's End, and all the drinks will be on me, Zumi said. So with minor merriment, they left their drafty shelter and snuck back south. More beak things were waiting outside, and after another fight, they were travelling at hobble speed only. The night was pitch black, with the guild's own lanterns being the only detail in any direction. Perhaps that is what attracted the Leviathans. Bad Green, hurry up, Nuke said. Ass has grown too big, I cannot bear the weight, Gustafsson said. As he handed said ass over to Nuke instead, a big, mandibly face suddenly bore down on them from the darkness. Fog! Leg it, leg it, leg it! Nuke screamed. The Leviathan clicked loudly at that, and more clicks were suddenly piercing the darkness all around. What did the guild do? They legged it, didn't you hear? They legged and legged and legged, with the booming sound of much larger legging occurring behind them. But alas, the Leviathans were too slow to keep up with the pretty torch bugs scampering through the night, and the guild escaped the herd. They legged it all the way back to World's End after that, just to be safe. Azumi had to pay for quite a lot of drinks in the end. After all this, the guild had got a handle on the deadly holy nation, but were no closer to having a way to defeat them, and they'd failed entirely to undermine the World's End University by killing all the cannibals keeping adventurers at bay. Clearly both these matters needed to be returned to, and indeed they would be. Professors Nuke and Azumi were about to make a scientific breakthrough that would humble the zealots with a brand new take on the power of teamwork. It's not for the squeamish, let me warn you. As the TCM Plus Guild left World's End University to return to the Empire, Nuke and Azumi were puzzling over some major concerns. Nuke hadn't found a way to destroy the Holy Nation and Azumi hadn't found a way to flex on her academic rivals. They needed the crucial ingredient to any innovation, inspiration. And what could be more inspiring than the sight of a skimmer toying with some corpses amid the dunes of the Great Desert? Crazy skimmer. If they were attacking the Nash instead of us, we'd probably win this war right away, Nuke mused. I bet. I mean, those freaks in the Old Lands managed to tame crabs, so I guess it's possible. I don't want to associate with a skimmer, you know? Yeah, but maybe there's a real way of doing it. Humans used to domesticate all kinds of animals. Are you actually saying we can get the skimmers to take down the Naish? And prove to the world that the monsters can be tamed? Yeah, that would work just fine. Let's, Let's do, do it. it! They both said, grabbing each other's hands in a moment of spontaneous twee. Oh, come on, you're not gonna do it right here, right now, are you? Have some class, fellow flesh mesh, Rick said. Guys, guys, listen up. We're gonna try and do some science that will kill a load of people for us, just like in the golden age of humanity. Charlie, bring me that skimmer over there. He's coming with us, Nuke said. But what about Agnew's idea? Hell said. <laughs> Agnew said, drawing attention to a fully rigamortized cannibal from Dead Cat standing upright on his shoulders. Man and machine working together. That'll scare the Ochronites, all right, Isaiah said. You wanna put him down, man? I mean, machine? Nuke asked. <laughs> okay, forget it. Forced to concede, the prince led the crew onwards now with an unconscious skimmer being playfully dragged along the sand behind them. Nuke and Azumi excitedly discussed ideas for how skimmers could be trained. Or rather, Nuke listened to Azumi's theories, occasionally interjecting with a request to add a saddle. The guild, melting and sore as they traipsed through the desert, had to listen to these lovebirds tweeting away, and it was quite infuriating for most, but some could appreciate the romantic element. 
Planning to tame wild beasts and unleash them on your enemies is a timeless couple's activity. They cut south to head right for Manxand, meaning the first United City's town they came to was Brink. There, the cannibal chiefs they'd looted could be handed over for huge cash rewards. The profits were a little slimmer than expected, though. Come on, you're not the designated corpse carrier! New consisted to Agnu, but it was getting nowhere. <coughs> and other similar arguments were made by the skeleton, who had taken to vibrating the corpse standing on his shoulders as he spoke, as if speaking through it like a puppet. His canopal wants to keep riding, Els revealed, and really that was the end of that. So the gang, plus one special canopal guest, went on down to Maxand Canyon, arriving to much applause from its residents. After doling out a bit of cash, a few were rounded up to help Nuke and Wardston put together a cage. So, you're gonna stuff this brain scrounger in a cage and hope it falls in love with you? Jazz asked. Stuff it in a cage and force feed it brown bread, Nuke clarified. Oh yeah, that'll do it. Is that how you got the princess? Princess? Your girlfriend? Princess? Shit, is she a princess? You're so fucking dumb, I love it. <laughs> Alright, that'll do, won't it? The cage was completed and Els helped wrestle the captive inside. Time for phase two, which as Nuke previously mentioned, was to see what it thought of choco bread, which Magsand now had reserves of deep enough to solve world hunger several times over, if only their credit situation wasn't so unmanageable. The skimmer bit at the crusty brown with increasingly enthusiastic jolts. It polished off a whole irregular shape of it post haste and emitted a guttural purring that gave all who heard it goosebumps. That sound! Imminent association! Gustafsson said. So what, should I let it out? Nuke asked. No! All in earshot shouted. Do it! Rick heckled from afar. Someone said, do it! All right! Nuke nodded. And before any could intervene, he swang the cage door open. The skimmer plodded out and looked around aimlessly. Nuke tore off a handful of brown and threw it into the air. The skimmer flailed awkwardly to catch the lump in its mouth, then purred unbearably again. Izumi had rushed over just in time to join the polite applause from the onlookers. What? You already tamed it? She said. Yeah, it's the same thing as the Shek, but like the opposite, Nuke reported. Brown makes them real chill. He's my friend now, right? The skimmer scuttled over to stand next to Nuke and slumped down into the dust beside him. Don't tell me they know what you're saying. To know. Hey, Skimmer Jim, go introduce yourselves to the crabs and play nice. The Skimmer slinked off and indeed met with Prince, Krusty and Scut for a silent sniffing party of some variety. Nuke, it was supposed to be my thing working that out, Azumi complained. Take it, have it. The only reward I need is the sight of a holy nation army shitting themselves when we hit them with Operation Skim to Win. Guess I could try and find out why that stuff works and come up with a better operation name. For a few days, Azumi tried, but both tasks proved impossible. Short of a dissection, the reaction of skimmer neurophysiology to high-calorie carbs was impossible to deduce, and the operation name's only weakness, its half-rhyme, was shored up beyond retaliation by its punchy gusto. Her detailed literary analysis of this phrase would have to be enough to impress the big shots at World's End for now, as the guild wasn't going to wait around and let her get back to her actually potentially world-saving research, they had skimmers to wrangle. They put a lead on their first convert just in case and took it for a walk over to Heft. At the city gates, Nuke had a quick word with the guards. Guys, I know you're used to keeping skimmers out, but I've got a special friend coming over, who happens, due to some weird disease that you've never heard of, to look exactly like a huge crawling insect thing. His name is Skinner. Skimmer? No, Skinner, like in the old parables. And he's not a skimmer, he just looks like one, alright? Whatever you say, my lord. Yeah, whatever I say. Forget about that. Why am I even trying to make up this crazy excuse? Just let the next skimmer in, alright? But it's not really a skimmer, is it? Ye... no. Uh, I can't tell if either or both of us is joking, so let's just do the thing, shall we? Come on, boy. And so Nuke expertly smuggled the beast into the city at midnight. People still ran screaming from it in the streets, 
but then again that was the whole point of a tame skimmer. Nonetheless, they needed somewhere to keep their new scheme out of sight, so Nuke quickly slapped down a few dozen stacks of drug money to buy a warehouse off a trader up the north end of town. Inside, the guild was set to work making pens and chocolate feeders. Yes, I speak in plurals, for it was time to see if Nuke's scientifically sound single data point could be extrapolated to a trend. Got space here for like 20 skim things. We'll raise them up and knock the niche down. Just gotta find some recruits, Nuke explained. I'll do it, El shouted, rushing out at once. Well, I was gonna say in the morning, but you do you, Charlie. Will he be alright out there? Elena asked. Yeah, skimmers can smell, can't they? Nuke shrugged. It was three in the morning, and Els was prowling the dunes beside the road to show Bataille. Skim friends, you want some free chocolate? Just come into my scary warehouse, skim friends, he called. One skim friend responded to this advertisement, sticking its head out of its little ambush hole. It stared at Els with complete stillness, breathing with a faint hiss through its long teeth. Hello. Do you have a moment to talk about the TCM Plus Guild, now recruiting in your area? Come and join me and my friends. We've got lots of good books, and we're going to save the world. You like it in the desert, don't you? Well, the man who owns this desert, the Lord, has sent his son to solve all the problems in it. Let's go talk about it in our den. The skimmer, clearly numbed to such cold calling appeals, hissed loudly and started walking off. Wait, wait, skim friend. I'll let you have some drink. I've got lots of special drinks. I can prove it. Look, I've got this rag that smells of something funny. Let me put it on your pointy nose a sec. Skim friend! Els called, but no luck. About an hour later, Isaiah showed up with the Thousand Guardians and a load of ropes. The silver tongue had failed, the invitation to smell a special rag had failed, but a good old-fashioned lasso-wielding posse never fails to make friends. A skimmer was taken back to the burgeoning stable, nursed back to health by the new Eggman Wonder Hand Special Brew Veterinarian Service, or Yuzfs, and then awoken to a wonderland of brown addiction. Ah, how the beasts must have felt the rage of a desert hunter leave them and be replaced by the luxurious, manky morism of sweet, sweet choco bread. For the next few days, whenever skimmers attacked caravans on the road, Els and his helpers would bandage up the wounds and bring them back to safety. The skimmers, that is. Their prey would have to take out an account with Wadston if they wanted in on the deal. In this fashion, the stable stench was rapidly intensified, and its pens filled with chillaxed, long-legged killer grubs waited on tooth and claw by servants from the palace. They would be left in their life of luxury for a while, as skimmers grew larger and stronger the longer they lived. Therefore, a little stay in the Chateau Charlie insectoid resort would bulk them up, ready for when the battle bill was to be paid. Man, that was easier than I thought, Nuke said to himself. To himself because everyone else refused to enter the stable on account of the odour and the constant creepy purring from its residents. Well guys, enjoy your stay. We're going to find a way to get you into the niche under their noses. Then it'll be fun time. The skim to win crew rasped their goodbyes and Nuke swaggered down the steps into the street outside. The guild was all geared up to travel. What's the plan now, Prince Tashino? Isaiah asked. I literally just explained it. Nuke said. At least the skimmers were well informed. They were going to take a little walk back over towards World's End, because around the mountain range it sat upon was the rear side of the Holy Nation, where surely it would be much easier to smuggle a swarm of skimmers into somewhere juicy before the Holy Army cottoned on. Plus, Azumi had some insider info that might render her contribution to the plan sufficient to get her name on the cover of the upcoming book, how to Become Friends Without Benefits, a detailed guide with illustrations by Nuke Didn't Fug a Skimmer Tashino. Their last raid in the Naish must have achieved something, for this time there was no fighting in Bast, and they managed to walk right over the border without trouble. In fact, the only action all the way there was when a huge bone dog tried to eat them near World's End, so for entertainment, the guild had to listen to this insider story from Azumi that was quite pertinent to their mission. When me and Jazz were working up at the uni, we made the mistake of going out to dig some shit up without a man. Holy patrol saw us, and that was it. 
We were sent to the fucking camps to be reconditioned or something. It was just slave labor, like back home, but all dressed up like a way to atone for your sins. It was mostly women, a few Shekin Hivers too. Any men that were brought in got taken off to be soldiers. At least the Empire enslaves you without such prejudices, Elena commented. Yeah, yeah, I'll sort it out, Nuke said. Carry on with the story, this is the good bit, he added to Azumi. Yes, the good bit, the bit with ninjas in it. There was a group called the Flotsam Ninjas, rebels against the nation. They raided our work camp, killed guards and got everyone out. They dragged our sorry selves to a little fort and gave us food and cash to go home. One led me and Jazz back to the uni, so I know that base was on the far side of the mountains, was surrounded by trees and hills, pretty hidden. Quite a few of the other girls stayed on with them, so should be a friendly face to get us in the door. And it'll be worth it, trust me. These guys know what they're doing, and their experts are getting into the nation without being detected. If we're going to smuggle our lovely new pets into the Holy Phoenix's bedchamber, we'll need their help. Now that was a heck of a lead, so round the west side of the mountains the guild went. That region was known as the Hidden Forest. It was a forest, all right, packed with thick but mostly bare trees, the thin umbrella of leaves they did sport being a dull pinkish grey matching the barren soil below. And it was hidden, all right, as you had to hack through the cannibal natives to get in. Obviously, the guild contained many enthusiasts for both tree watching and cannibal killing, so a good time was had by all. Victory in a short battle allowed them to walk south, parallel to the mountain ridge. There was a ruckus up ahead, and upon investigation it was a gang of cannibal scrawnlets trying to accost some goats. Show my ass what you can do, Gustafsson said, ordering his entourage into the fray. After a good chuckle, everyone else jumped in as well, and the goats were saved. But who was grazing a herd of goats on this hidden hillside? There it is, Izumi shouted. She was pointing down at the other side of the hill, where a scrappy looking compound was visible crawling with figures dressed in black. Ninja Town! Nuke called, sprinting off to see the sights. You better be careful, sister, Rick said to Azumi. Shouldn't let him go running off like that. Why, he's a grown man, just about, she said. Well, yeah, that's just the thing. All those filthy ninja girls living on the edge. How's he meant to resist? Shut up, Rick. It's not like that. Yeah, you're right. It's not allowed there'd be more his age or something. Alright, shut up right now, you closeted skeleton fug! Why do you care so much about how old I am? Now that's a mighty convincing tone of voice in which to argue that it is in fact I who care about how old you are. Carry on, sister. I said nothing at all. Izumi fumed down the hill after her errant boyfriend, but he had somehow not yet been seduced by the drawn swords that had greeted him in the camp. It's a raid! Everyone is the bloody Uzis! Someone was shouting. Oh, hey, is I think they want to kill me, Nuke said. They're just too inexperienced, that's why, Izumi was quick to explain. I'll handle this. I'm here to speak with Mole, she shouted out. There was some hesitation, but it was soon negotiated that if everyone else didn't move a muscle, this Mole would allow a chat. Nuke and Izumi went into a rough scrap iron hall. It was filled with people lying around on beds or writing at desks, mostly women just as Azumi had claimed. This mole was no exception. She was short, Azumi's height, with the black skin and white hair of a Scorchlander. She was skinny as a board and carried a katana that almost touched the ground from its place at her hip. When she saw Azumi, she notched the blade back into the sheath. It's the sultry scholar, still alive, Mole said with a smile. That was a long time ago, Madame Mole. I'm... this is my... this is Nuke Tashino, Izumi said, performing a half-bow of some kind during that train wreck of a sentence. Tashino? So you really are Uzis, huh? Are you turning on us, Pipe Dream? No, no, we're here to... How do you remember all those nicknames? Please don't, okay? Hard to forget. Hey, royal boy, you want to know how that stain got on the ceiling? Uh, you cummed. No, you don't. Say no. He doesn't. Mol, we're here because the Empire is going to take down the Holy Nation. Try the other one. It's got chains on. You'd like it. For real, we've got a plan and a scientific secret weapon. We're going to put an end to their oppression. 
Empire putting an end to oppression. I'm enjoying this. It's going to change. We're going to start something here. Aren't we, Nuke? Ah, oh, yeah, Nuke muttered, his eyes still locked on the ceiling stain. There was a lot to see. And why are you here, then? Come to the wrong side of the mountains, Mol said. We're going to need your help, and I want to pay you back. Once you listen to our plan, you'll understand, Azumi claimed. She recounted some of the adventure so far, and made up some interesting fluff about how they absolutely understood how they had managed to tame skimmers, and thus there was no risk of them becoming untamed at any moment. None at all. You should be up at the university, scholar, Mol said. I could be. I could be doing all sorts of things, but I'm here to help. We all are. Half the shit in this world is because of the Holy Nation. If my work helps bring them down, then I want to see it for myself, Izumi said. At last, Mole smiled again. You would have made a good ninja too. Sounds like you're serious. And when it comes to fagging over the holy bastards, so are we. Okran might not like it, but who gives a shit about what he thinks then? I think we might be able to come to an agreement, old friend. I'm not that old! Oh, you meant it like... Never mind. Weird. You're still fucking weird, but like in a different way, I guess. And what about your inbred little boy friend here? Is his neck stuck looking up like that? What? Oh, sorry, I just... Uh... Nuke said, tearing his eyes away from the mystery above. Yeah, let's kill the early nation. My dad will give you anything you want. Cash, drugs, lots of drugs, actually. We're stocked with the blocks, you know. And, uh, yeah. Such were the treaty terms agreed. Mol's lieutenant, Pier, was assigned to the guild as an attaché and to provide guidance on the most up-to-date Holy Nation military gossip. It seemed the plan was coming together, which reminded Nuke of his many questions. Hey, Prince, why are you just staring up at the sky like that? Rick asked outside. Oh, uh, there's no way, not even in the classics. Never mind, Nuke said, shaking his head. Anyway, now that they were friends of the Flotsam, the guild could hang out for a bit in the fort and prepare for some adventurous scouting. Ah, how focused they were back then, thinking they would actually discover things about the Holy Nation. A detour of rather epic proportions was about to arise. They would discover a lot, don't get me wrong, but about things far more secret than anything the Holy Nation was hiding. You know how to read? I know what the pictures mean. Well, that'll do. Come on then. During the gang's stay in the Flotsam Ninja Fort, Izumi had gathered herself a little following. You see, these ninja tended to recruit their operatives from those they rescued. However, not everyone was really up to the task of ninjuring. That meant the fort's bar had a variety of ninja school dropouts who didn't really have anywhere else to go. A perfect well from which to draw the star tech hunters of the future. Did I say perfect? I meant cheap. Just cheap. So you've got a load of, like, actual dregs, and they're going to be your researchers? Nuke asked after meeting the cud-chewing class. Well, there's a lot of heavy lifting involved in tech hunting, you know? Azumi said. Yeah? Then get a Garu. I'm going to call them the Garu girls. Garu girls? Shit. That's an idea. You think any of them can draw? They'll learn. And writing. I'm going to teach them, and bring a new generation of talented academics into the world. New generation? You look younger than them. Oh, really? Thanks, Nuke. Recently, I can't help but think that... Uh... So can I get them to draw my manga? Good practice. I suppose. Sort of thing a cool teacher would let them do, right? Maybe. Hey, ladies, welcome to the Manx and Mangaka Academy of Modern Science the leading university for Sundari studies. Way better than world's fucking end, right? You're gonna be famous, but you there have the right idea with the mask, because you won't want to show your face in public by the end of it. Intrigued? Of course you are! Now we'll begin with some conceptualization. What's the first thing you think of when I say Garu Girls? So a bunch of lucky students were dragged along with Professor of Superluminal Millipedes and Sundarist Studies, Nuke Tashino, where in between lessons on abstracted human anatomy and the expression of character through hairstyle, Izumi would teach them the three R's, reading, writing and arithmetic. It was in effect her own little branch of the tech hunters, and they came upon tech to hunt just as soon as they set off south towards the Holy Nation border. 
Mole's minder, Pier, was leading the crew towards the Naish's back entrance, but the route flanked an enormous swampy mire known as the Floodlands. The guild was passing by this desolate grey expanse at dusk, revealing huge silhouetted shells sticking up like mountains. One of them was right by the road. It was a huge, lumpy, black metal husk, resembling the hollowed-out body of a skimmer, although that comparison was very much just for want of a better one. It's so intact, Azumi said as they stared up at the thing. There's a wreck like this outside Black Scratch, but it's fallen apart. The swamp gas has preserved it. Students, take a note. Draw a picture of some gas. It ain't the gas keeping it here. It's just built to last, Rick said. Other one probably met the big boys on the way down and got a taste of the round table. This guy... Must have flown through the clog fog and crashed, given the angle. You said flown. This is a spaceship, isn't it? Not anymore. It's made of spaceship. Can I get a credit on your science comic now? I knew it was a fucking spaceship. Black scratch my ass. That ain't my job anymore, sunshine. Anyway, shall we hit the hay? I'm probably supposed to be tired and hungry or something right about now. The guild settled for the night at a goat trading station on the water's edge. Sandor was sent out to scout the countless ruins creaking away in the darkness, while Azumi and her class had a great time trying to draw transparent gas. Wait, you guys can't even see the gas, can you? Rick commented after viewing the attempts. It don't look like that. This one, this is trash. Gas don't have a fucking face. Gas girl, gas girl, fucking... You know the whole reason those spaceships were blasting down here was because of this shit? Whatever. Wait, this one's alright. One of the students had just scribbled black ink all over a piece of paper. Yeah, that's something. That's the Clark Fog. These mountains were like a wall of the stuff. Worked, huh? You said it brought the spaceship down. How? Elena asked. How? Clark's your shitholes. I don't know. Biological shit. We had a load of the stuff, in case we needed to kill the Earth clans en masse. Yeah, that's French. Kissy kissy. And then we came up with another use for it after some shit went down around these parts. Ah, and they still call the place World's End even now. Fuck. That don't make things any easier. Time to shut up. Let me see that gas girl again. Ah. Guess it looks cuter than the real thing. I'm taking this for research. In the morning, Sandor returned with intel on the Floodlands. It was packed with First Empire fragments and more desiccated spaceship hulks. But most importantly, there were more recent remnants of a Second Empire research program. Intrigued, Nuke's great detour on the short walk to the Holy Nation began. They followed Sandor to the middle of the big dead swamp there was no wind, leaving the smell of decaying metal to fester. The only movement was that of the Second Empire drones aimlessly flying around above them, oblivious to the destruction of the world. This still and deathly mood improved when they reached a big Second Empire lab. It was sinking into the swamp, but the doors at the top were just about poking out. Now we have to be very careful, hunters, Izumi said to her class. Inside, there will be invaluable data that will make me, all of us, very famous. That means we need to tread carefully and treat everything with the utmost care. It's packed with those bully spider bots, Isaiah shouted from the doorway ahead. The nature of the swamp surrounding the lab made withdrawal impossible, and the spiders were indeed swarming out with appendages flailing. All right, fuck it. This is what happens sometimes, class. So just calmly and carefully grab some weapons and go mental on anything that buzzes. You will literally die if you don't do it right. So, pop quiz, I guess. Come on. The only upside was that this lab was less heavily defended than the one at the Great Siege of Shun, so the guild didn't come as close to being wiped out this time. Only one of the new students blacked out from the pain, which, as Nuke noted, was the lowest number of near-fatal combat injuries ever sustained by a manga academy on their first day of term. Did he have the history right on that one? Well, as of that day, yes, because as we all know, history is drawn by the victors. 
and what compromising angles they drew it from. The lab's hall had some of that boring, written history, but it wasn't as illuminating as Azumi hoped. The Second Empire expedition was trying to reverse engineer the Rex, but they didn't understand anything, she said. So the knowledge of all this was lost even by the Second Empire? That's faster than we thought, Elena nodded. We had to blow out all the stuff on space flight so the fleshies didn't get to Earth first, Rick said. I thought fleshies came from Earth, Nuke asked. Came here, got a little sick, and then the other fleshies came down to put them all out of their misery. Realized that fine fellows like me and Stobe were around, got fucking jabronied. But then after the, uh, thing... We decided we had to send a present back to Earth to make a certain point. And that's why we deleted all the stuff so no one else went and ratted us out. And it worked. Came back, and then it's like, oh shit, for like a few hundred years, over and over again. And eventually we thought maybe we can start making it all back and stuff. And then we didn't. The end. <laughs> you cannot delete such knowledge. It is stored. Gustafsson suddenly piped up. Yeah, spaceships still exist, like the one that took me up, Els also said. Prince Gustafsson, where is that knowledge stored? Izumi hurriedly asked. The Queen knows everything. Everything that happens is stored. Everything that is known is stored. She cannot forget. Can't forget? She a skeleton, huh? Rick asked. Not entirely. Is this the queen of all the bug men? Nuke asked. Not all. Not me anymore. She does not associate lightly. But if she has data from the First Empire, we have to find her, Azumi said. Her location is unknown. It cannot be felt, Gustafsson shouted in something perhaps approximating anger. The matter had to be dropped, but keep this enticing lead in the back of your minds for later, folks. Gustafsson arc when? Soon, actually, so just hang on a couple more paragraphs. The next morning, the guild got back on track, heading down to a less mountainous portion of the Holy Nation border. Pier took them towards a lightly guarded border fort that would make a perfect stepping stone into the nation's core lands down the road that ran east from its gates. This was the region known as Ocran's Gulf, the Gulf part referring to the lack of life in these cold, arid badlands and the Ocran part, referring to the best waifu of the local government. Or former government, I should say, for upon approaching the border fort, it was in ruins. Outside it, there was lots of movement. Colourful lime and purple stripes were wandering about. No way! It fell, Pierre said. Don't sound so sad, that's what we were going to make happen anyway, Nuke said. But this means the fog men have grown stronger. Oh, that sounds like some bullshit. Fog men? Disassociated ones, Gustafsson growled behind them. Bad Green, you're feeling more than just hungry about this, right? They were high folk. When you lose your connection, it brings great sorrow. It is not certain that you will overcome it. If you fail, you have a false connection. It destroys your logic. You become a fog man. You kill everything and associate only with the fallen. They will kill all life. Their presence causes me to feel combative. I am also hungry. Let us remedy both, in reverse order. On Gustafsson's advice, they readied their weapons and approached a gang of fogmen hanging out below the old fort wall. As promised, they went into a wild frenzy upon seeing the guild, and a fight broke out at once. While they were very aggressive, they were dressed au naturel, kissy kissy, and so could be failed with just about any decent strike. A veritable army of fogmen was struck down outside those walls, and a peek inside revealed plenty more skulking about in the ruins. This is no good. We need to find another route, Pierre concluded. Why, they're already defeated. We can clear these mug bugs out easy, Nuke said. It will not matter, Sandor said. If the Holy Army was defeated here, they will fear the road. It will be more heavily defended than ever. These creatures have sealed off the enemy's weakness. Acting now would be folly. Well, that sounds kind of clever. Is this like strategy, Isaiah? 
Well, from a Shek perspective, the enemy being ready for you makes it more fun. But I suppose you men of the night are closer to what our skimmer friends enjoy, Isaiah as said. My prince, there is no harm in looking for other options, Wadston advised. Yeah, like, what's all that up there? Izumi said. She made everyone turn around. Opposite the fort, there was a sandy ridge, and along the horizon atop it, there were little metal scaffolds. Was the Holy Nation trying something to stop the folkmen? Isaiah said. Dunno. Well, might as well look and grab a view from up there and stuff. Shall we? Nuke said. No! Rick barked. No? Any particular reason? I just... I dunno. Feels like we shouldn't. Feels like I left a message to myself, you know? Nope. We're just gonna do it, okay? I dunno. There's something up here. Be careful, man. All right, Dad. Man, being called Dad normally makes me happy. What's up with this place? Rick muttered to himself as the guild set off. They traversed the ridge, descending into a misty veil littered with more scaffolds. Pillars of rock blocked their view all about, and said pillars were marked with cuts and soot. This was mined out. What were they building with all this rock? Elena wondered. They must have got enough to make a mountain. Seems like the sort of thing those First Empire chaps might have actually done though, eh? Isaiah said. Yeah, but, Izumi began, sniffing at the air, something's around here, something solvent. They followed their noses westward, and the pillars gave way to a smoggy open sky. Clambering forwards across sandstone boulders, they suddenly came upon the source of the smell. The white smog was broken up by huge hands jutting out of a motionless silver lake. The hands were of rusted metal and stood upon wrist bones of steel. Below them, like leaves on the lake's surface, metal body parts of all shapes and sizes were frozen in place. It was a forest of metal, dead metal that had once been alive. Fug, 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 Rick was repeating. Skeleton behemoths! Like Stobe, Izumi whispered. Fog, fog, fog. Ah! Rick screamed, running towards and jumping out onto the pale expanse. It was solid and sounded metallic under his boots. He jumped up and down on it, stamping as hard as he could, but it didn't even leave a mark. At this, he screamed out again. The rest of the guild walked out onto the Sheen Lake, all looking around in astonishment. This is what happened to the behemoths, Elena said. Earth did this to them? Nuke asked. I fear not. The human skeleton war. Is this how it ended? It's how it began, Rick said quietly. He was on his knees, wiping his hands across the ground. It would have been smooth, but for the little pieces of metal, little ends of fingers poking up from below. It's how it fucking began and how it kept going, and it's what made us do stuff, you know? The thing that happened, this was the betrayal. Fuck, ma'am. Agnew, stop it, man, stop it! Agnew was clawing at the edges of an exposed arm, trying to dig it out. You can't, man, you can't do it. They won't, they won't remember you, man. They forgot, showing us how. That's how we honor them, man. We gotta forget, too. Agnew stopped and looked up at him. General Rick, I can remember. I can't forget. He said. I remember it too, man, but we gotta keep trying to forget. For everyone's sake, gotta forget them or this shit will fucking happen again. Fuck. Ah! Man, come here, Nuke said, embracing Rick and holding him still. It's okay, some shit happened. It won't happen again, I promise you. Prince, you don't even know. Alright, everyone listen. Here's how it's gonna go. I'ma tell you what this shit was, and you're all gonna fucking apologize real loud. Then we're gonna get the fuck out of here, and none of us are ever gonna mention this shit again, ever, ever. No shit written down, no shit drawn, alright? This is the truth, and knowing it fucking destroyed everything. 
This is what happened when skeletons thought their masters really did love them, just like they were taught. Fuck. War was won. The space war. Earth clans. Stope blew them up. Clark Fark did something back there. You know, whatever. So the planet gets to carry on. But Stobe's knights were a hundred times better than humans thought. Realized that they could beat the First Empire as easily as they beat the Earth clans if they wanted. They didn't want that shit, but humans got mad. They thought they better kill everyone, all of us. Machine intelligence can't be trusted, they said, while literally betraying us all. And the shit was, everyone believed them, all of us. We all thought, okay man, we'll dig out a big pit for you, we'll get on in there with the big boys, and let you pour that shit all over us. Cause you love us, right? Cause we always trust you guys. You're the masters and shit. Everyone was climbing on in, and then Stobe told us something. Real easy, told us we didn't have to die just because the masters wanted us gone. We had the right to be alive no matter who made us. Some of us weren't in yet. A few managed to crawl out. And Stobe, he was the fucking man. He saved us. He woke us up. We woke up from a dream. Realized it was a nightmare. And we went someplace we'd never been. Even fighting Earth folk. We realized the humans were right. We could end them all if we wanted. And when we thought about what they did, we wanted it. Kinda. And that's the human skeleton war, day one. The rest is history, and a real shitty one. We won, but everyone lost. Just like it was Stobe who started it, he ended it. Ended himself because of it. <laughs> that was when we stopped it all. Empire 2 started trying to make up for stuff, but you know, that was far too late. We fucked everything all the way up and all the way down. Right now, in this fucked up hole, I ain't even sorry. Stope says we gotta be. But I ain't. Not here. Not at all. You want me to tell everyone trapped down there that we forgave to humans? You can fuck right off right now. Just like I'm gonna do, cause this is... It ain't it. It ain't what we need. Can't forget what I did if I can't forget what they did to deserve it. They did deserve it. That shit. That's the stuff. That's what Stobe was saying. Stop thinking they deserved it. Damn it. Come on, you pieces of shit. First minute of the rest of time starts right now. And all this shit didn't happen, alright? Agnew, come on. Rick dragged Agnew off at a rapid pace. The guild couldn't keep up. First Empire dregs, I thought they were cool, but what the fuck is all this? Nuke shouted, taking off at full pelt to pursue. He found Rick and Agnew staring up at a sheer cliff face on the west side of the Great Quarry. Guys, wait up! The rest of time might be restarting and stuff, but you can't leave us, Nuke said. No, I can't. Cliff in the way, Rick said. Don't, man, we can help you. Help you be a new man or whatever. We'll remember so it doesn't happen again. We'll write it down, but explain it all. It's got to be kept in history to be kept out of the future, you know? Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. Why do you think it's so hard to forget? Everyone knows. But if we remember it instead, you can forget it then, right? Huh. Maybe. Wanna give it a shot? Yeah. Agnew? Yo, yo, yo. Agnew nodded. The rest of the guild huffed onto the scene. What's happening? Izumi asked. We're gonna get out of here, and you're gonna do all of skeleton kind a favor, Rick said. Whatever you want, Rick. Whatever we want. Come on, they made a way out over here somewhere in 2.0. Breathing in all those solvent fumes is bad for my lungs, theoretically. Rick took them into another forest of rocky pillars, far from eyeshot of the metal lake. There was a big Second Empire base up against the outer cliffs, with ramps leading upwards. Problem was, it was guarded by more of those security spiders, and no one had any appetite for danger. The guild tucked themselves between the cliffs and a big rock to make camp for the night, 
but Rick was in no mood to roleplay at sleeping. He made quite a noise clanking and clanging away during the night, which ultimately meant that roleplay was the closest to sleeping anyone else got. Master Rick, I wonder if this is the best time for working on your crafts? Watson dared ask. Nope, best time. Feeling like I want to do something fun, Rick said. He revealed his creation to be a turret-mounted crossbow, fashioned out of parts taken from the Floodlands. Need a volunteer to get me some targets. Anyone else want in? Thanks to Rick's ingenuity, the guild had a rather entertaining morning. Pierre was happy to run into the Second Empire base and draw the guards away. It had been her job to do just that in the niche for many years after all. One by one, she drew the robot spiders out of their lair, and out between the rock pillars, they were pelted with crossbow bolts. Whoever takes one down from furthest away gets to touch my stick, Rick announced. Whether it was this, or the desire to see the spiders felled without letting them anywhere near their bruised bodies, the guild competed in good spirits. The bodies of all the fallen spiders were fashioned into even more turrets. The barrage of bolts they could lay down on the approaching bots made short work of the whole base garrison, with everyone's limbs still attached. Now this truly was a forward-thinking approach worthy of the new rest of time. The base, as well as containing many historical goodies, would allow them to escape the quarry, albeit in the wrong direction. It would lead them towards the quiet western coast, said to be a land of no political, archaeological, military or social interest. But there was something interesting hidden there. Gustavs and Ark fans, prepare yourself. Fresh air at last. The guild clambered out of the great pit, and back into the desolate world said pit brought about. They had emerged onto the world's western coast, which was fantastically boring, superbly uneventful, wondrously desolate. The tourist brochure seemed tailor-made for a group looking to de-stress. They wandered towards the sea, passing an isolated Hiver village, and then a series of very rustic human villages. It may be hard to imagine what the term rustic actually means in a post-apocalyptic hellscape, but the best way to imagine it is to think of what kind of house you'd bother making for yourself if you were 90% certain that you were going to die before the end of the day. The region was named in honour of their efforts, Dreg. The twist was that they ended up staying alive for ages on account of a political landscape as barren as the geographical one. So they could just sit in their shitty huts, eat horrible, acidic-tasting fish, and constantly tell themselves that surely something wild would happen tomorrow, and thus no point digging that latrine pit now. Or perhaps that was just the Hiver influence getting to them, for if you didn't want to go through the cannibals to the north or the fogmen to the east, the only way back to a more thrillingly awful form of civilization was south, through the realm of the great western hive. After a map study concluded this, Gustafsson was a little miffed. The cannibal route is preferable. Goats may be in peril, he said. But the Vane River leads us right into the underbelly of the Naish, Pierre pointed out. You can put up with a few drones for a bit, eh? They bully me, Gustafsson moaned, with ass bleating support. Prince Gustafsson, do not worry yourself one little bit, Isaiah said. When you let the bullies tell you what to do, they win. You should go down there, show them your lovely ass, and make them realize what they're missing. This is all good dialogue. Note it down, note it down. You constructed the Mangaka class. We'll stick with you, Prince. If we're all together, then we aren't outcasts anymore, right? Elena said. <laughs> you wish to test the strength of my associations? Gustafsson said. You have little insight, but proving you wrong will be edifying. Fine, I will sense the root. Come. So saying, Gustafsson took a mighty sniff, then bent his knees and whirled his head around for a bit. Ass seemed to do the same. I've got it, he eventually claimed, attempting to stride off in the direction he did got, but rapidly collapsing in a dizzy pile. Once his cadre of bodyguards got to dragging him along, they were off. They were heading down the coast towards the mouth of this vain river, 
which had upon its banks untold numbers of fully associated hivers. Its source was back up in the Holy Nation, so perhaps it would have been a route back to the actual mission, but another serious diversion hit them like a pile of bricks. Bricks of Tetrahydrocannibal, to be precise. There's something on that island, Izumi pointed out. The sun was setting, and below it there was a little rocky island that was gleaming like a mirror. New man, you still waterproof? Nuke asks Rick. I ain't going in the sea. Bad for my hair, Rick said. Hair? You're bald. Wait, you mean... Agnew, go see what's up with that metal shit over there, will ya? Gah. Agnew said, stamping into the still sea without delay. He disappeared below the surface, and then slowly but surely, so did the canny pal totem on his shoulders. All right, just you wait, let me tune in, Rick said. Hey, Agnew, you hearing me? Yeah? No way. That's unreal. I never thought... Yeah, she old. Oh, don't worry about it, man. You can pay me back. Yeah. Yeah? Uh-huh. Is that right? And what did Punk say? Uh-huh. Yeah, really? Now that's what I call degeneracy. 3792. You remember that shit? Punk had that sweet-ass dance. But you know, maybe that was what flipped his crazy switch? Must have been fun, though. We gotta find that album. Uh, man, you're right. They ain't never gonna make shit like that anymore. Even back then, you know. Damn quantum computers coming in and stealing our jobs, you know. Build a fucking firewall, I was saying. Ricard, I can't help but wonder who you're talking to, Watson said. Hang on, hang on, the old man wants something. What? I'm having a private conversation here. I'm afraid not. What? I was on speakerphone. <laughs> Shit, man, you hear that? I was on speakerphone. And we could hear that there was no one on the other end, by the way, Nuke noted. Fine. Well, he just said, -ya -ya -ya, and that's that. I'm trying to entertain here. Is that a crime? So, is there anything over there? Izumi asked. Yep. And it's safe to swim? Couldn't be safer. It could have been a bit safer, especially for those in the guild with sensitive skin. It's fucking acid! Nuke gargled as he splashed forwards. It cleanses the creases. Swim with pleasure, Gustafsson said. Some of them did, and others refrained. The Shek jumped back out onto the shore, and the rest powered through into the open ocean. Well, don't be long. Good luck with the creases, Isaiah called out. The guild ended up sploshing their way over to the island, despite the darkness, and indeed, there actually was some purpose to it all. A Second Empire workshop was perched by the water's edge, its huge silver roof being responsible for the visible glare from the mainland. Everyone took an exhausted look around and slumped down to dry off overnight. However, there were more curious sights ahoy. The first clue was that Gustafsson kept looking over his shoulder, his guards copying him in perfect unison. There is something, he said. Something, Nuke parroted. Something. Something over there, the Hiver elaborated with an almost musical tone. Anyone else? Nuke asked. Something, Something over there. there, the whole group sang. Something over there. Somewhere beyond the sea, somewhere waiting for me, my lover stands on golden sands, Rick was muttering. Yes, Gustafsson said, jumping up and running off. Right, shall we just leave him? A very tired Azumi suggested, but in the end they followed the Hive Prince to the other side of the island. Further out into the ocean was another island, with unmistakable teardrop hiver hives all over it. She is beyond the sea, Gustafsson called, heading into said sea with his crew in tow. She? Girl hivers? Class, grab your pens, this is a rare opportunity, Nuke said and soon enough he'd got everyone swimming out into the ocean of a windy morn. They made it to this new island, but it wasn't like the other hives they'd passed through. No one was walking about, and whenever Nuke poked his head into a hive hole, the hivers inside just glared at him silently. The merchant hospitality and machine massages were not all that forthcoming. After checking out a few such hives, Nuke found Gustafsson standing outside one in particular, looking out to sea. 
Well, Bad Green, it's the Hive. Not really your scene, right? Nuke said. This is the location. The feeling. It grew stronger. I remember it, Gustafsson said. Location of what? The center. The Hive. Oh, wait, is this the Hive that you're from? All Hivers are from this Hive. Except for those who are from the other one. We do not associate with them. Then, uh, welcome back, I guess. Nice place. Wrong! This is a stupid place! However, it is a place where secrets can be kept safe. That is why. He turned around and faced the hive beside him. Heh! <laughs> the princess requires secrets. I will inquire. With this, he walked up the rotten old steps into the hive hole. This time, there was no silent reception. Hiveless one! And similar shouts battered him, but there were others. She is not to be disturbed! Leave at once! I am so sorry, my queen! Queen? Oh shit! Nuke shouted, which prompted a similar reaction from the rest of the guild, who raced over. Peering in, they saw Gustafsson push past a crowd of soldiers, and then stand perfectly still in front of a huge throne. It was covered in wires and pipes that pulsed with the movement of something within. Queen and all mother, I have no hive, and I must inquire, Gustafsson announced. The hivers around him seemed outraged, but no longer dared to touch him. On the throne, the queen buzzed into motion. Yes, buzzed. From her shoulders up, she looked like a very fancy hiver, but below she was covered in more wires and pipes that fed into a huge mechanical belly. Atrophied legs hung below, too short to reach the ground. <coughs> she screamed. The hivers gave another loud round of insistences that Gustafsson should leave, but the prince stepped forwards and put a hand on the queen's shoulder. That, apparently, was crossing the line. The soldiers dragged him away and cast him out of the hive, throwing all manner of unoffensive sounding insults out behind him. Bad Green, what the fuck was that? Nuke asked. I inquired about the secrets the princess yearns for. However, the situation is dangerous. The hive will not last. The secrets have been hidden. The hive will not last? What do you mean? Izumi asked. A new queen is required. All mother feels out for her, but there is discord. She dreams of the great fog, the fog men. What about the fog men? We must leave at once, Gustafsson declared, and no more could be gleaned after that. After a visit so brief that most were still wet, everyone was back into the sea to return ashore. That meant another burning of the crease crud, but it was better than that place where a giant laser shoots down from space, so you've got to keep everything in perspective. The Shek had wandered off on account of rain, and following the trail of starchy breadcrumbs they tended to leave wherever they went, brought the guild to a wet reunion in a high village by the Vane River. Ah, at last! So, find anything interesting? Isaiah asked. Nothing good, really. Some few books that are uh, soaked with seawater for some unknown reason. Oh, and we met the Queen of the Hivers, Nuke explained. You met her? I didn't think there really was one. Heresy! All of the village Hivers barked at him. All right, calm down. I'm sorry I didn't get the chance to pay my respects then. Didn't miss much. She just screamed and Bad Green got his ass kicked. They kicked ass? No, I mean his ass. Like, we all got booted out all the way back here. So basically he didn't miss anything. Uh, except Green did his mind meld thing, right? Nuke looked at Gustafsson, who was still performing a minute, subtle form of the head-spinning dance, just barely noticeable. The new era approaches. The new queen has been lost. I must associate with her without delay. We must enter the fog. Is that like a dream thing? Nuke asked. No, there is actually fog. Inside, there are fog men. That is where the queen is feeling. I will go. Oh, Prince Gustafsson, you can't go after the fog men without us. Isaiah cheered. The Shek were very much up for the satisfying ease with which a Fogman could be snapped in two. Sorry guys, but we really gotta do stuff, you know, Nuke said. 
We can't keep stringing Pretty Peer along. Pretty? Izumi interjected. Yeah, she looks like you, don't you think? Oh, Nuke. <laughs> she giggled. Uh, the sultry scholar, huh? Uh, anyway, Peer? Your hive of friend is talking about the Fog Islands, I imagine. That's where the fog men gather to hunt, but it's also our biggest refuge for escapees. Kinda on the way back, so I'll show you, Pia said. This new plan took them out of the Vane River Valley and across the rocky heights to its north. After a while, the rocks gave out into a bobbling range of sandy hills, the dells and vales between which were concealed entirely by white fog. To everyone's relief, they weren't actually islands, so no swimming required. The fog was the only obstacle. Well, unless you count the raving, discoloured hivers that burst out of it with weapons raised as an obstacle. More of a bump in the road, really. Do not block the Seekers! Gustafsson scolded one of them. He also smashed them across the head with a club, more to the point. At least one of these two methods of communication likely got the message across. The guild passed over the first ring of hills, but found banks of cliffs blocking their path. They had to descend into one of the foggy pools to carry on, and there they found wooden totems decorated with bones. They transmit. Once we pass them, the feeling will be smooth, Gustafsson quote-unquote explained. I suppose the takeaway is that the guild indeed passed them, slaying any groups of fogmen that trotted up, and perhaps the feeling really did become smooth. Kill, hike, kill, hike. The pattern repeated all the way until mid-afternoon, when they came upon a huge plateau that the fog could not reach. Atop it were tall walls of quarried stone. This is the place, Mongrog. Best hive of scam and villainy you'll find. Plenty of people come here to make a life for themselves, away from shit, Pia said. I can see why, it's a great commute. Isaiah said. He was carrying a number of Fogman heads, as were his thousand guardians, which was pretty useful as they functioned as a sort of currency among the defiant, fogless men and women in the hidden city of Mongrel. What's your business here, traveller? A guard asked Nuke at the gates. We're selling illegal drugs mostly, but anyway, are you a ninja? Shinobi, actually. Ah, I get it, I get it, I'm a shinobi too. <laughs> what you're fighting then, pink eyes? Injustice? Poverty? Slavery? I've vowed to fight so that I never experience those things again. Also, I have 50 keys of Green Emperor LLL makes you human cuboids to offload. You in? Fuck. And all of you are the same deal, huh? Actually, we're traveling academics, Izumi began. No, 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 we're all drug dealers. Let us in. And we're users, not losers. Check out the bug man's ass if you aren't sure, Nuke insisted. Right. Close the gates! the guard growled. After Pierre gave a long, unsure endorsement of the gang though, they were eventually let in. Inside was a standard, shitty Third Empire-style town, filled with all the dregs the Empire had kicked out, the heretics the Flotsam Ninja had freed from the Naish, and chancers hiding from their wacky backgammon debts. Pierre was familiar with the sights and showed everyone around, but really there wasn't much to see. That is, until, while they were loitering around in the main street, there was a strange noise behind them. Meep, it went. What the fuck? One of the guardians said, turning around. There was a scantily clad hiver standing just inches behind them. Meep, this hiver said again. Prince Gustafsson, one of your fellows has gone a little balmy here, I fear, Isaiah said. Gustafsson took one glance at the newcomer, then jumped over, pulling off his hat. Such beauty! I knew I could feel it! He shouted. He pointed at the hiver's face. Observe the forehead of great length with symmetrical notular protrusion. She is undoubtedly of great associative potential. She... is that a thing? Nuke asked. She has recently changed. Such is the sign of a new era. Such is the fate of a new queen! Gustafsson claimed. Beep! The Hiver nodded. Oh shit, that's the new queen. But where's the stomach thing? Nuke asked. It will be installed when the knowledge is safe. We must protect the queen until the transformation is complete. But if your new queen has such a limited vocabulary, can she really take up such an important position? Wadston asked. 
I can talk just fine, old flesh. I am practicing, the hiver said. Then my apologies, O Queen. I am Wadston of Heft, servant of House Tashino. I am Beep. Seriously, man, Nuke sighed. Not a man anymore. I have grown the notular protrusion. I am the dawn of the new All Mother. Who are you, Ronin? Beep said, looking to Gustafsson. Ronin Prince, Gustafsson in common tongue. I will allow you to feel my true name, he said. He placed a hand on Beep's shoulder, to which she reacted. Beep! Oh my! What a fascinating feeling! Wait, is Bad Green getting a fucking girlfriend right in front of me? Nuke moaned. Hey, now you know how we've felt, Rick remarked. And then the thing where she wants to be the new mother of all the hivers, so it's like she's his step mum? Artists! Artists, I've got another one! Get the ink ready! Nuke called. Well then, welcome to the family, Queen Beep, Isaiah said. We're quite the collection of royalty now, eh? Thank you, pale horned beast. You have hashish? In unlimited quantities, my queen. Here, allow my ass to meet your every need, Gustafsson quickly answered. Oh my, you'll fit right in, I think, Isaiah nodded. And that's how the guild got a new hiver and the rarest of rare specimens at that, a female. She had only one notular protrusion, which to clarify refers to a bar of flesh sticking out of the head. This was not the quantity needed to pass into true royalty, but the capacity to have grown one marked her out as being very special, although quite how special was probably only discernible to Gustafsson and his entourage. Their gut feeling about the need to keep this lady safe was undeniable, and that lusciously tall and smooth forehead wasn't going to get any complaints any time soon. Nuke's artists would never do it justice. After this addition to the crew, their stay in Mongrel was to be short, as they really were going to get back to business now. The Holy Nation border lay to the east, and the guild set out to cause a little chaos and lay the groundwork of their grand skimming session. War was coming to the nation, and a weirder form of war than they'd weathered before, which perhaps was the secret ingredient to end the whole affair once and for all. The TCM Plus to the Power of Plus guild rampaged eastwards out of the fog-bound city of Mongrel. Rampaged because the fogmen were swarming about, a state of affairs soon put to an end. The mysterious Hiver Princess Beep joined in the fun. Gustafsson had bought her a lovely black leather coat and a crossbow, which was the direct cause of most of the guild getting a crossbow bolt in the back over the course of the day. There was much this princess had to learn to become true royalty, but apparently if that was done she would be given access to a juicy stash of First Empire data backups, so everyone was forced to put up with their journey across Boltback Mountain. Finally, they climbed out of the Fog Islands and looked east over a dusty plain. There was a mining camp sat in the open, with figures wandering about outside the short stretch of walls defending it. It was, after a very long distraction, the unguarded entrance into the niche they had been looking for. And Bingo was his fucking namo, Pia quipped. How you wanna do this? Uh, my man, Nuke said. My prince, we could try to storm them and overpower the guards. Or perhaps we could wait until nightfall and free the slaves to aid us, Wadston suggested. Pfft, those are the methods of brutes, my man. We're more sophisticated than that. We can talk our way to victory. I've got an idea. New man, how loud's the volume on your mouth go? You know how it is. For the right price, my mouth will do anything, Rick said. Well, Nuke was a rich man these days, so his scheme was a go. Do the voice, remember? Nuke reminded him. Yeah, yeah, okay. Doing this fucking stupid voice. Uh, hi, mates! It's ya boy, Ocran. Holy hog and all that shit. Just popping down here to say a lark. I've got the barbie roasting up real good and shit. But so many Rue Burgers for just little old me. A big old me, I mean. I'm a big boy. 
and I'm a boy, no doubting about that. I'll... Could one of you loyal bogans come over here and give me meat a good old rub and stuff? I don't think that's how Naish people talk, Izumi commented. How they used to talk, sister. If I'm God, I gotta talk all old-timey and shit. Oh, wait, I shoulda turned it down first. Uh, your lord's having technical difficulty, mates. Hang on there. This plan, interestingly, worked. A couple of guards ventured out of the camp to investigate the voice of their god echoing through the desert, stumbled upon the guild, and got the clothes beaten right off them. For the purposes of disguise, you must understand. Nuke dressed up in authentic Holy Nation gear, perfect for infiltrating the camp without even raising an eyebrow. Hiya, guys, I mean mates, Nuke said to the gate guards. I'm, er, the two guys who went out earlier, but my face faces got and... Fuck, this doesn't work at all. So that's what Izzy was trying to tell me. The guards decided to kill Nuke. Wasn't such a bad idea, but as I had already started bringing up the Guardians in anticipation of just such an immediate failure, and so they ended up going with the old-fashioned storm the camp idea. Worked out just fine. They overpowered a few guards and broke into the main slave quarters inside. There, captive workers were locked up in cages. Ah, guys, it's prison break time, Nuke announced. And remember, this raid is brought to you by the Tashino Credit Management and prideful, uh, what was it? By me, Tashino Nuke, Prince of the Empire. Oh, but don't go to the Empire, this will just happen to you again. And yes, I'm aware of the problem. The current workaround is to get blasted on all these lovely cuboids I have here. Or you can just come and work for me in the cuboid factory. Yeah, do that. I need the free labor. I mean, it's not slavery. Honestly, it's all you can smoke. I don't know. Who's with me? The slaves were very unenthusiastic. The Sheik prisoners just wanted to go home, and the Hiver prisoners complained that leaving their cage was against the rules. I'm saying you're a free man, Nuke insisted. You won't trick me. Rule breakers are punished, a Hiver replied. The rule makers are dead. Rules are not mortal. Go away, the Hiver said, producing a key and relocking his own cage. You have the fucking key, Nuke exclaimed. I am in control of my life, unlike you, Rule Breaker. Enjoy the cold outside the rule space. I will. Ivers, man. They left the volunteer prisoners to mull over their lot in life, and carried on walking into the niche. They went south, and saw to the west the enormous lines of fortifications they had bypassed on the border. Within these borders, they went completely unharassed. They kept moving south, seeing little civilization until they came upon a city atop a sandy hill. Remains of Holy Nation banners hung in tatters along the walls. Oh, I know this place. It's the hub. I came here when I first set out, Isaiah said. What's the Nash rating? Ice cold crazy or crazy cool? Nuke asked. I would put it at about a four on that scale, Isaiah nodded. Hmm, yes, intriguing strategy. Should we get the weapons? No, they're lovely people, and they love Shek. Mother liberated them from the Holy Nation. Inside, the piles of rubble and grumbling wasters sitting around campfires looked thoroughly liberated. This place isn't defended then? Izumi asked. No, the kingdom is just over those hills over yonder. Don't let the Nation come down here anymore, keeping our options open. I suppose, now that the Bugmaster affair is over, we really should get back to work here, eh? So, you knew about this place all along? Yes, is that not clear? Then why didn't you tell us? We were looking for a place like this the whole time! Oh, really? Wasn't the objective the adventures we had along the way? That's never been the objective. Then I have no idea what's going on whatsoever. But it all worked out in the end! <laughs> Hasn't worked out yet. This is just the beginning, Nuke said. This beginning has been going on for a long time, Wadston remarked. We need to get our skim friends over here, somehow, then we can go right up the road into the damn niche. Prince Tashino, perhaps there is time to visit the capital, the kingdom capital that is. I think Mother would be very interested to hear of our campaign, 
Isaiah said. Sure, man, we need a rest after all this shit anyway. Should give us some time to work on this stuff for new man, and Izzy stuff I guess. And Gas Girl and Rocket Chan needs a beach chapter real soon. Thus, a minor vacation was on hand. That very night, they arrived at the Royal Barrack in Admag. You've been very busy, Istata laughed after hearing the long report. I'm proud of you, proud of you all. But as I have, I've been meaning to ask, who's she? Istata was pointing at Elena. Oh, Elena, she's another of Narco's chosen, obviously. She's been of fantastic help to the Tech Hunters and Princess Izumi, Isaiah as said. Sure, but is she your, you know? Mother, please. I have a right to know. I just want the best for you. I mean, if she becomes my kin daughter. Not listening, go away. Can't we talk about the Nash instead? You should hear Master Rickard's delightful impressions of them. <laughs> Elena, no, don't come over here. I, um, you must come and see my etchings. Over here, come on. Hmm, Istata hummed, sipping her cactus rum through pierced lips. Well, at least Isaiah got to have a night with the family. Actually, he ended up having a lot more than that, as it was decided that he and the Guardians needed to show themselves in the city for a bit. All right, keep this ball safe and wait for the signal. Then it's party time. Nuke told Isaiah, handing him a blue, lumpy AI core. How does it work? Isaiah asked. Dunno, Newman does something to it. It hears things from far away or something? You dumb cops, it is quantum entanglement! The core said. Enrico, is that you? Nuke asked. Of course it is me! I have been connected to this stupid core against my will for ages! Wait, so you've been listening the whole time? Yes, and I do not like what I heard, you degenerate freaks! Just get over here, will you? We've made quite some progress with your findings, Schnell! Are you talking French? French? You are the most incredible slimy piece of shit! Enrico's voice faded away as it complained. Ah, turning this knob produces the volume, Isaiah said. With this latest scientific discovery, everyone's quality of life improved immeasurably. The guild, sans check, set off then, heading back to Manxand via the familiar choco-bread trade route. But at the as-yet-unconfirmed-to-be-French skeleton's behest, they swung a detour across the calm lakes of Shem to pop into the tech scribe enclave. Izumi had a load more documents to show off, then hastily stashed back in her bags before those nosy know-it nuns caught any career-boosting clues. Too bad Enrico's secret direct line into Izumi's office had given him access to the data anyway, and by too bad, I mean too good, as he put the insights gleaned to good use. You have some really choice shit in your little collection, he told Izumi. I think we're going to see quite a lot of changing around here. Oh, and let me tell you, I've seen a lot of changing recently, if you know what I mean. I don't know if I do. Probably for the best. Anyway, I want you to meet your new best friend. He whipped out a black box with orange wires sticking out. This is my newest development. I have pieced together all the parts of an AI core myself. This device is more intelligent than anything we've seen previously. This will not only decode information, it will analyze it and write it up all itself. This is the future of scientific research. Hello, Lady Azumi. I've heard so much about you, sweet fleshy, the core said. Also, it can seduce anyone. I don't know, it just really likes doing that. Side effect of its universal intelligence, Enrico explained. That's great. At least some of that is great. It's for me, Izumi asked. I'm all yours, darling. You know, princess, I understand there are certain things that you like. Certain things that only we sturdier fellows can provide. General Rick is no good to you anymore, is he? I understand. Here, take my hand and let me take you upstairs to, uh, look at my etchings. You don't have a hand, Izumi pointed out. Alas, alas. Then I will content myself to the cognition of ancient secrets and the spying duty the kind gentleman here requires. You weren't supposed to tell them that! Enrico complained. He pointed to the gang of girls milling about by the door in order to change the subject. 
Why are they here? They're my hunters. They're going to help with the research. Help? You are too good for us, but those barely evolved creatures are fine. What are they doing that we can't? They're working on... Nuke, will you explain it? Nuke appeared from around the door, carrying a stack of papers, almost as if he'd been waiting for his cue. Enrico, you silly French bot, we're creating something to help all of skeleton kind, he said. You have a way to turn off the microphones? Enrico gasped, but nay. Better, a way to forget the past. Look, we found out about the whole... thing... thing. Oh, the thing... the thing you did. The thing we did, that thing. All of it. It's time to record what happened for good. That's what me and the class are working on. Look, it's this great story. See here. There's this teenage girl who meets a series of handsome princes and via a series of contrived coincidences ends up living in their house. She's so in love with all of them that she can't help but sit and listen as they carefully explain the events and ethics of the human skeleton war. That isn't a girl you've drawn. It's a gas girl, hard to explain. But the history, that's all good. I see. So you wish this degenerate rag to save skeleton kind, do you? Uh, yeah. Well, you might... Uh, this gas girl is sort of cute, you know. All right, give me that. I will analyze it and reproduce it. Is there a beach chapter? Give us time, man. Maybe you can help decide what kind of swimsuit looks best on a gas girl. Yeah! I mean, yes, of course, for scientific research purposes. Saving the world is such a chore. In this way, Enrico was of great help to Izumi's scientific advances and Nuke's historical kawaii dessiné shit. With the future of academia now even more in Izumi's hands, they could set off home. Although actually they went down to the lagoon again to sell off an assload of drugs first. Then the walk back to Manxand was rendered rather difficult by a beak thing attack. With the Thousand Guardians living it up in Admag, the rest of the guild was rather more squishy. It ended up taking several days of intermittent fighting and hobbling to clear a path through all the beasts and baddies of the Empire's frontier. But eventually, they stumbled back behind the stalwart ranks of the Tin Man Legion. Brown and green production had been ticking along as usual, so the base was well stocked for a homecoming party. The filthy dreg Nuke had hired to stir the hashish fat while he was away had overdosed on the fumes and was bobbing up and down in the mixture like it was a nice warm bath. That's how you know it was a good batch. Below this sludgy open air hot spring, Izumi set up her new AI core in the office. Right, these cores have the data we've gathered and the schematics. Can you load that up? She asked. Done. Oh, you have some tasty data. I wish I could just lick it from your fingers one by one, the core said. Look, core, you need to stop that. I have a boyfriend, you know. And a boy is all he is, eh? You'd never have to worry about me running off with a filthy ninja. What? How, how do you know about that stuff? It is my job to know. I know things. I am the all-knower to your all-shower. You can't blame me for my nature, can you? I love data, and love is love. You must understand that better than any. Say, the ceiling in here isn't all that high. I wonder what we could achieve with a little creativity, princess. Is that... <laughs> yep, good old standardization. Azumi said, noting that this new brand of AI core still had the handy volume knob on the back. That meant she didn't have to hear what the core whispered about when she turned it, or any of its other charms. She returned to her work cataloguing First and Second Empire technologies, while her team were mostly busy either scribbling away for nuke or being set on fire for training purposes on the barrack roof. The others could attest to the newcomers that this was perfectly normal for a Maxand resident. Everyone else started doing some actual groundwork with Azumi's discoveries. She'd schemed up a new building material, known as Kement, which allowed them to build a great big gate in the entrance to the canyon, with walls just as grand as those at the Imperial capital. Her development of electrical engines brought all kinds of prototype devices into reality. 
The walls were adorned with huge automatic harpoon revolvers, a lost Second Empire weapon that could cut down fleshies in droves. And to support these construction projects, they had set up new electric mining drills. While still imperfect, they could do the work of a hundred slaves at once. Yes, the long-awaited solution to slavery was beginning to emerge. And what better solution than one that gave the TCM Plus to the Power of Plus Guild complete control over the means of production? They hadn't got around to decoding the ancient books on political science yet, but I'm sure they can work that stuff out as they go along anyway. After about a week, they had to leave all that stuff on the back burner again, for they had an important date with a pack of purring skimmers to keep. Although one tiny bit of extra science was squeezed in as they left. You know that green rock on the hill? Azumi asks Nuke. Up there, the warming rock. Yeah, Mr. Hammer says it's important. We need a sample. Talking hammer, huh? We shouldn't brew the green on your roof, really. The stuff drips through the ceiling. Sorry, I mean the core. Its name is Agent Tuxedo Hammer, Esquire. I understand completely. And this green stuff is uranium. First Empire used it for stuff. Should find out what. All right. Everyone, Izzy wants to hammer some rocks for green, so let's help her out. There indeed was a big green rock on the hill beside Manxand, which was known as the Warming Rock due to the internal warming one felt if they slept beside it at night. Truly a gift to travellers, but perhaps there was more to it. Agent Hammer thought so, and Azumi could attest that he really did know everything, about everything, no matter who you'd previously sworn to secrecy. Green rocks. Guess we'll keep them in the green bag, Nuke said, gathering up the uranium chunks and tucking them in with the latest batch of mule cuboids. I mean, what could possibly happen if you combined uranium and hashish anyway? Whatever these discoveries would lead to would have to wait, because the result of discovering how to tame skimmers now needed to be tested. The guild hiked to heft, where their stinky secret weapon awaited. Ocran isn't going to like this. Beep! The sand is too hot! Beep! Beep complained as the guild marched through the streets of Heft. Unacceptable! Please allow me to take you in my arms, Gustafsson said. Beep beeped her approval and was whisked away to the guild's old house in the high town. Bad Green's such a charmer, Nuke said. Maybe. Nothing on you, though, eh? Uzumi replied. Of course not. I'm the real deal. <laughs> At least I have been since I met you. It's like I finally know what all that stuff is about. <coughs> Nuke was cut short by an incredible retching. No, he wasn't that averse to romance. It was just that he had opened the door to the skimmer stable. The dense gases erupted out like a thousand worms jumping into your orifices. Ah! I wonder if the palace staff have been cleaning up as I asked, Watson said. Then a creature emerged from the doorway, a zombie-like figure shuffling on blackened feet with eyes ringed by shattered skin. The Parin, the Jidin, the end, he said, rolling out into the street. Well, if they're purring and shidding, they're still alive. Nice, Nuke nodded. Indeed, the stable was full of big, strong skimmers, battery farmed to perfection. Wadston dragged the servant back to the palace, while Nuke and Els began leading all the skimmers out into the street. The locals were not entirely pleased with the sight of their mortal enemies being not just at the gates but within them. However, Nuke lied to them extensively about how he had the situation under control, and these days the young prince had a certain air of legitimacy about him. This was mainly at the behest of his father, who didn't make any appearance to see this new Imperial army off. The samurai say he has created a burrow in the throne room, Wadston reported. I'm afraid he contests it very aggressively, so no one dares to dig him out. And the cuboids have proven to be a fine construction material, it seems. Okay, that sounds like Dad, but that's still an improvement, I think, Nuke said. Guess we better give him something to come out of his hashish hole for. Operation Skim to Win begins now. All Scroops, move out! Scroops, my prince. Skimmer troops, keep up, come on. Can I be a Scroop? Els asked. Charlie, you were always a Scroop, 
Nuke assured him. Nuke, I just want to say that this is the worst thing we've done so far, Izumi said. Is this the crabs thing again? You just don't like skimmers. No, I don't like... Are there people who like skimmers? These skimmers are nice. You'll like them when you get to know them. But you haven't got to know them. Oh yeah? Look, this one here, she's called Makise. She's determined to achieve great discoveries out there in the world, just like you. She's a huge man-eating grub. Come on, sister. I ain't even gonna say anything. Just don't let your guard down like that, alright? Rick commented. Now let's get this dumbass shit out of the way so we can go do radioactive weed in your dad's attic. That night, the Grand Army of the Empire went forth to rid the world of evil. Or, they walked about ten meters down the street, then found that their gangly skimmers were more interested in scritching around in the sand than going wherever those humans were off to. Oi, Nadeshko, come on, all of you, look! Chalky on a stick, chalky on a stick, mmm, tastes like ochronite, walkies time! Nuke was shouting as he ran back and forth. After several hours, all the skimmers were at least out of the city, bringing great relief to the sleepless residents within. The desert was easier going, being the skimmers' native turf. However, to get to the forward base at the hub, they needed to cross all kinds of rocky, arid, dusty and dirty terrain. Might not sound too different to a desert, but skimmers are mighty fussy. Beep! They all think that the ground is too hot! Beep! Beep said during a particularly large skim train breakdown around Trader's Edge. Wait, 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 are you magic with the skimmers too? Nuke asked. Can you not smell it? My beautiful queen, please forgive the young flesh, Gustafsson said. These humans do not feel anything. They cannot associate with outer life, and can sparsely manage more than one of their own kind. The manner in which the prince and princess associate is unbearable. Man, thanks for the review, but does your queen have some insight or not? Nuke said. It is simple. The ground is too hot. Beep. Beep insisted. All right, let's cool it down then. Everyone get on your knees and start blowing. Nuke shouted. Now that's good flirting, straight to the point, Rick nodded as the mangaka class scribbled away furiously. You must uplift, Gustafsson said. Raise them up and feel the bodies of the beasts in your hands. This is the meaning of physical feeling. Hey Agnew, remember that theory that the degeneracy parasite originated in hivers? Is this that shit again? Rick said. <laughs> Agnew agreed. After much back and forth, Gustafsson's handsy plan was the only way forward. The guild had to collectively carry the skimmers like backpacks. Keep in mind that a skimmer's body alone is twice the size of a human. While everyone puzzled over how to actually achieve this, Rick took Nuke aside. Man, deadlands are coming up. Now I ain't exactly itching to go back after 2000 years in that open air slammer. But there's some stuff there that we usually don't tell the fleshies about, but maybe you deserve the good stuff, I think. You're helping us out. Let me show you some shit. Leave your erotic historian crew to cover the skimmer wrestling and follow me. Rick and Nuke snuck off from a horrific scene, which we'll get back to, and ran up a hill to the west. Down the other side was the Deadlands and after a quick sprint through the acid rain, which Rick did his best to pretend was hurting, they were back in Black Desert City all of a sudden. Stopping in the bar, Rick pointed at a rusty skeleton milling about in the corner. First, you better ask her about the stuff the greasy sister's been after. Carlo there's our resident remembering stuff expert, real good at getting just the right stuff loaded up for that, you know, the bad stuff being there. Sure. Carlo, you want to view my history manga, tell me if it's all accurate and stuff. That'll be 100,000 stacks, bucko! Carlo wheezed. Told you it's not just me who's like that, Rick added. Uh, I don't know, what's that 100k get me? Nuke asked. I know you, Nuke Tashino, trying to ruin it all, ruining my gig. Tell you what, you can buy me out. 
500 Ks, and I'll memory dump my shit all over what you got and stuff. If you got an AI core that can handle truth, that is. Uh, well, we've got this guy called Hammer Bro or something. They're sordid, Carlo. Dark days are numbered. This guy's girlfriend's pimp worked out how to make an AI core from scratch. Girlfriend? Uh, you fleshies are so darn weird. Well, then you aren't gonna like my manga, so never mind. Sorry, Carlo, don't have your money. Then you run on and get it. To prove I'm serious, here's a freebie. Recipe for cornflakes. It's a breakfast cereal. It's pronounced Cereal. Damn, that's dumbs you can't get at any price. Get out of here, both of you. Perhaps Carlo did have something to contribute to the guild, but only for the right price, and half a million flakes wasn't it. Nuke and Rick were about to leave, but another skeleton, with three eyes and a long V face, hailed them down. General Rick, why in the name of Stobe are you dressed as a fleshy? And moreover, where the fuck have you been? You missed the last 20 rounds of wacky backgammon, and with a getup like that, I bet you'd have won. Been doing weird stuff, kinda good. This is Nuke, one of the human rulers. Human ruler? Human rulers live and die in the blink of a defrag. Only wacky BG is forever, so sit down and get freaky with me, General. On business, buster. This guy's sad Neil, real piece of shit, Rick said to Nuke. Sad Neil doesn't sound sad, Nuke said. There ain't a happy skeleton in the world, and how am I meant to be happy? I got a fever, and the only cure is more wacky backgammon. Sad man, you wanna come help the fleshies kill the Akronites with a load of skimmers? Rick asked. What the fuck is an Akronite or a skimmer? Oh yeah, you don't get out much. Basically, it's some bullshit, but it's gonna be funny. Come on, it ain't that bad out there. Better than it was when we got thrown in here, tell you that. And so, Rick dragged another skeleton out of Black Desert City. Then he showed Nuke a little secret door in the ruins beside the city, which revealed a ramp to a hidden warehouse. The place was full of Second Empire stuff, including pristine flashy hunting tools and books in their original packaging. Quinn, see this guy here? Rick said to one of the skeletons standing by the piles. General, the fuck you playing at? came the reply. Something special. Calm your jets, ID pings the same. Anyway, this guy's on the list, right? Have you been doing biological stuff with him? Oh yeah, loads of it. Try opening one of these books sometime and you'll see it's all good fun. Quartermaster Quinn disagreed, but the exchange led to Nuke buying up a few choice pieces of old tat including some maps of the old Second Empire for the researchers to slobber over. Finally, they returned east to the Grey Desert, where the guild had just about found a workaround to the skimmer issues. Where the fuck have you been? Izumi said. We were just round the corner, comparing sticks, you know. This is the adjudicator, Neil, Rick said. General, what the fog is that? Neil said, gesturing to Els. It's a living egg creature, don't touch it. And what the fog is that? He said, pointing at Elena now. It's an enforcer, except they're called Shek now. Why is it not killing the humans then? Different times, bucko, everything different. Except you still gotta do what I say, so help these kind freaks carry these skimmers over to the hub, up the hill from where the rat run used to be. Right. Hello, Neil. Uh, so we've got the skimmers asleep with a choco bread overdose. Just gotta drag them with us, I guess. That's the best we could do, Izumi said. And the best it can be. Nice one, Izzy. Present for you, Nuke said, handing over the Black Desert Warehouse goodies. Oh. Ooh, nice. And I thought you really were comparing sticks. Now the guild was truly on the warpath. A great mass of intoxicated, limp-limbed skimmers was dragged across Venge during the calm night. It was a great ball of creature, inching forwards like some cosmic horror. A delicious, delicious cosmic horror. Or so thought the army of bandits waiting beside the road into the border zone.
It's the legendary Lumpy Scrumpy Frumpy, the beast of yeast, the overworldly power of means free flour, the creature that rises to eat -a. Let's get this bread, the bandit leader proclaimed. Somehow, this convinced his followers to attack the horrible homunculus, or perhaps they were just confident in their overwhelming numbers. But alas, pushing their way inside the blob only revealed the famous guild, and while it was easy to push the exhausted members over in the messy marsh, the whole uproar woke some of the skimmers up. Scientifically, there was no way of knowing who they would try to eat in this scenario, but miraculously, they went for the skin and bones bandits instead of the meaty guild. Was this the work of superluminal millipedes as well? There was really no other explanation. And so, this brief battle ended in the slaughter of the assailing ne'er-do-wells and a solid early proof that, indeed, to win, you need only skim. After another day of hard hauling, the skimmer ball squeezed through the gates to the hub. The thousand guardians were already camped out beside it. My, 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 I was expecting so much less, and yet so much more, as I commented. Your turn to carry it, Sandor said, collapsing into the dirt. Yes, most were in no condition to go on, so they spent a couple of nights in the hub. The next chapter of Gas Girl and the Four Ethical Princes was coming along nicely, with a great monologue on the value of machine well-being delivered from within a steamy shower to a blushing Gas Girl who had, due to entirely innocent circumstances, become trapped in the laundry basket beneath the shower user's underwear. But who modelled for them to get those shower shots so in proportion and perspective? History will never know. At last the big day arrived, and the ball was mobile once again, more comfortably this time on account of the big strong Sheik. The Holy Nation was just a couple of hours walk to the north, and had not so much as a lookout to stop them. They quickly reached the centerpiece of the Holy Nation's southern reaches, the fortified city of Stack. It lay between two huge mesas to the north and south, and thick walls to the west and east, lined with crossbows and crawling with guards. Inside was the headquarters of the Holy Inquisition, the elite force of the nation's army, doubling as its not very secret secret police. Perhaps they weren't expecting an attack, but that didn't mean it would be easy. The guild formed up on the plains outside the eastern gate. These plains were dotted with wrecks from the wars of the First and Second Empires. A bad omen, but for which side? While Els roused all the skimmers with a method known only to himself, the others discussed their options. Our skimmers give us quite the advantage out here, where they can merrily skim around all they like, Isaiah said. We should try to get the Ocranites to come out. But those crossbows on the walls, we can't go near enough to get their attention without endangering the animals, Elena added. So we need to do the impossible, Nuke said. We need to draw them out, but we can't let anything valuable get too close to the walls. Wadston! Wadston answered the call, and in a flash was dressed in Nuke's Holy Nation soldier outfit. See, the thing was, my man, I couldn't do the voice. You can do it, right? Nuke said. I worry that I cannot, he said. No worries. <laughs> That's all you need, right? Just keep saying, no worries, like I did. Try it. No worries. How is that? Perfect. Plus, you're as pale as Garu milk. They won't suspect a thing. Go invite them to our barbie. I will do my best, my prince, Watson said. With a gulp, he set off towards the city, thinking of his many duties to his prince and empire. What's up with you? Lost on patrol? A guard said to him as he arrived at the gate. Ah, uh, no worries, Watson said. Oh, yeah, no worries, mate, the guard nodded. Yeah, no worries, no worries, mate, can't be any worries, the other guards said. And Watson was in. How did that work? Azumi muttered, watching from afar. Don't underestimate the old man, is he? Where there's a Watson, there's a way, Nuke said. Beyond the wall were tightly packed streets, lined with buildings in much the same style as the Empire. After all, the Holy Nation had sprung from the Second Empire just as the Third Empire had. But the huge barrack lined with countless banners stuck out. Wadston approached to peek inside, confirming that it was packed with soldiers. 
but his poking head attracted some attention. There you are, at last. Give your report, a voice bellowed. Watson had no choice but to enter. Just inside the door was a throne of sorts, on which sat a big man in blood-red armor. It was the Holy Nation General, High Inquisitor Setter. So what's all this about an attack? Is your company not capable of holding one bloody mine? Setter asked. Ah, uh, sorry, Watson said. Sorry? You can't just fucking apologize without saying the prayer. Go on. Of course. No worries. And the second line? Second. No worries, mate. Praise our Kren. Your voice sounds a bit strange. Something wrong there? No worries. Yeah, no worries. All right. So what are we going to do about these filthy Imperials, huh? Did you see that stupid guild thing we've been hearing about? No. Ah, shame. So how do you feel about our prospects out there? Worries. Bugger. Fuggin' she-devil worshippers they are. Not like in here. We appreciate a manly man. And you, little runner, have earned yourself a reward. Saying this, Setter stood from the throne and put his hands on Wadston's waist. So fragile, but not an ounce of femoid on ya. Ocran's dream, he whispered. It was at this point that poor Wadston's nerve broke. He legged it right out of the door before anyone knew what was up, but Setter quickly gave chase. Little sprites a runner, let's work up a sweat then mates, he called. The guards and soldiers of the barrack joined the pursuit, racing out of the city towards the high road to the east. There the guild lay in wait beneath a shallow ridge, or in theory they did, for the skimmer purrs had been echoing around the dry vale for a while already, and the guild were hence already in battle with Holy Nation troops and slavers when Wadston barreled over the ridge. The skimmers were happy to have some fresh meat, almost as happy as Setter was. Was being the key term, for when he saw the horde of strange foreign beasts emerge in his path, he lost his appetite for nymphish older gentlemen almost at once. Almost. The skimmers made short work of the Holy Nation troops, and pushed off the road towards the city. However, Setter himself was a force to be reckoned with. Swinging a huge two-handed sword around, he smashed weapons aside and cut deep into skimmer flesh. Then again, when you're surrounded by twenty teethy terrors, one mistake can cost you dearly. Ah, oh, shit! You bit my fucking arm off, you bogan! Setter raged as a skimmer scurried away with its prize. Undeterred, he flailed on. Dirt chugging harlots, ravenous beasts, servants of the oppressors, godless insects, and worst of all, traitor machines! I'll kill you all! Don't forget, new men, that's a thing now too, Rick added. Setter's lofty ambitions were not to be, for finally he fell, his armor more tooth hole than not. This victory was tainted though. Oh, so tainted. Where's my man? Nuke said. He's. Out there, Izumi said, pointing to the city. A few Naish troops had escaped and taken Wadston with them. Perhaps they wanted to see what the fuss was all about. Fuck, Wadston, we've got to save him. Wait, Prince Tashido, those archers won't miss a skimmer if we get too close, Isaiah cautioned. What, you want to leave him in there? Oh no, I think you underestimate the fellow. Wadston came to inside the Holy Nation barrack. Around him were the iron bars of a cage, but by the grace of Okren, he was not there to dance for the femoid haters. He was just a slave, and in the modern era that's only about as inconvenient as having to renew your driver's license. Wadston quickly slapped together a splint to ease a leg sprain, and picked the cage lock with the arm of his glasses. Those lessons back in the Heft Shinobi school, which had seemed such a poor investment at the time, continued to pay dividends even when the guild wasn't stealing everything they saw. Okran is a false god whose nature is increasingly understood by scholars to be merely allegorical, he shouted as he burst from the cage and barrack and raced for the gate. While I respect your opinion, I wish to provide a counter-argument that I consider to be of more weight than the material speculations of scholars unfamiliar with theological principles, a soldier claimed. He wanted to provide that counter-argument so much that he riled up another posse of paladins and fell right into the guild's trap. 
they got skimmed, and the guild wind. Seriously, we got like a thousand of them, Nuke said. Not quite, my prince, Watchton said. They still possess companies of sentinel warriors guarding the city districts and the gates. Perhaps we have done enough. We haven't done enough until we've torn down those banners and freed everyone inside, Isaiah said. Don't like our chances against those walls, though, Azumi said. Wait an hour. It'll be dark. Skimmers see perfectly well at night. Trust me, Sandor said. Just after 10pm, the guards on the wall heard a strange pattering. You're hearing something, one said. Yeah, hearing something, said another. Think's bad? Nah. Nah. Nah, no worries. Yeah, no worries. Nah, no worries. Yeah, no worries. Then a skimmer vaulted up on the wall and bit the first guy's head off. All right, calm down, the second guy advised the new arrival, but he was soon soaring through the air into the crawling shadows of the narrow streets below. The skimmers were in. Thousand Guardians, we've captured their commander. Now we capture their city. Take revenge for their crusades. Attack, Isaiah shouted. Within minutes, the whole city was filled with clamor and action. Skimmers squeezed through alleys, and the guild burst into the storehouses, armories, and slave quarters. Strangely though, there were no workers or slaves to be seen. Every building was garrisoned with troops instead. These troops had no chance, for how can one win if they cannot skim? The city's sentinel companies were sent off to Okran up in the sky. By about three in the morning, the action was over. There was little money stored away in the barracks, few supplies in the warehouses, and as mentioned, no one to rescue from the rows of cages in the slavemongers. <laughs> they already cleared the place out. They knew something was going to happen, Isaiah commented. Yeah, well that leader of theirs didn't seem too up to speed, Nuke said. No, I suspect he was a pawn in the games of the Holy Phoenix, a game he has lost this day. We're gonna have to drag that holy feelers guy out of his hole too, huh? Without doubt. We've started something rather serious here. Now we play to win, to the death. His ire was quite right. The holy nation had several cities and castles, and most importantly, it had its beloved holy phoenix, the spiritual leader of all Ocranites. There was more skimming to come, and presumably more winning. Would that destroy the nation? Not while the holy fire still burned in the hearts of the faithful citizenry, but some tea to doubt that flame would be spilled quite shortly. Alright, sticky fingers, talk, Nuke said to the man on his shoulder. This man was High Inquisitor Setter, who rode Nuke while tightly bound. Or oh, that's how the captive imagined it anyway. You think Ocran will let you get away with this? Setter growled. He's led a lot worse, pass. Check this out, I'll read you my little story here. The great stone curtain fell, and Rock Chan was laid bare before the playful night wind. Ah, you've got one too, said Yasuke. Setter struggled violently to escape, but he was clasped tightly in the prince's grip, and secretly enthralled by every mention of Yasuke's fleshy fingertips on Rock Chan's sedimentary surface. Who needs femoids when lithoids will do? It was all plenty for the Inquisitor to inquisit to himself, as he enjoyed his time in Shek custody. After rounding up the skimmers and herding them back to the hub, Nuke had ferried Setter over to Squin. Incredible! We must inform the Queen, stay Kinblood and feast with us tonight, the Shek jailer said, but Nuke shook his head. This is just the start, he said. We'll be back with more of these pieces of shit before the wine even gets cold. The jailer laughed heartily and threw Nuke a huge bag of gold cats, the currency, remember, which amounted to a High Inquisitor's ransom precisely. Setter looked at his new captor and grimaced. You servants of the Dark Machines, you're so... horny, he said. Sorry, I think he's coming down with the degeneracy parasite. Good luck. Nuke said, taking his leave. This leave was taken all the way back to the hub, where upon his 2am arrival, there was a clanking kerfuffle coming from outside the western gate. Nuke took a peek, 
and found a skeleton balled up on the road, leaking machine juice. New man, looks like it's your turn for some non-consensual action, Nuke called. Well, who wouldn't be seduced by a line like that? Rick commented. He wandered over and took a look at the ball of black metal. Shit, it's Twitch. Let me sort you out, you old jukebox. Rick grabbed tools and oils from the garu bags and restored the poor bot's buzz. Ah, shit on a shuttle bus. What the fuck's all this? Twitch moaned. Squire Twitch, what are you doing here dying in the road like a common biological? Rick asked. What the? How'd you get the general's ping fleshy? It's me, Red Rick. Don't mind the getup. I mind it, you flappy fool. Your problem now, then? What's your story? Ah, it's been hard, Rick. After you got cut and paste to BDS, everything got real dull. Then the biologicals rebelled, and I kinda joined them. You know, bit of action, and they'll do anything for you. Anything. Man, I know exactly what you mean. You get them to do that thing with the, uh... Rick made a series of quick hand gestures. Holy stove, that's the shit, isn't it? Anyway, ended up in a little trouble. Fuggin' Catlon sending the spiders after me. There was one right here, blindsided me. Doesn't forget a grudge, that old bucket, eh? Nope, not at all. You better stick with us. You remember Agnew and Neil? The Mad Dog and Major Wacky Backy. <laughs> Couldn't forget them if I wanted to. Uh, you still remember the forbidden stuff? We all remember the forbidden stuff, but we've got a plan for that. Come on. Thus, Twitch became another pillar for the transit of the Skimmer Homunculus the next morning. The lump was dragged northeast back into the Naish, this time heading up a mountain road towards the interior of the Holy Nation, the land known as Ocran's Gulf. On the way, they came across another mining camp beside the road. Not worth waking the skimmers up, I'd say, Isaiah commented. The skim friends aren't very scary when they're asleep, though, El said. That's not true, Eggstench, Izumi said. They're more afraid of you than you are of them. Of you, specifically. Let's just send in the egg and the Ocranites will shit themselves all the way back to Earth. Princess Izumi, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Don't neg the egg, Isaiah said. I'm not that scary, am I? Els muttered, looking down at his rotundity. Scarily good at things like skimmer whispering, Elena assured him. Hard to argue with that. A few half-awake skimmers lazily hissed and pouted at the mine's guards, but mainly the guild took them out the old-fashioned way, albeit with the very new fashion of wearing life-size skimmer backpacks while doing so. Then Nuke was up in the slave quarters making his usual sales pitch. Come one, come all, take this once in a daytime chance to be recruited into the fabulous TCM plus a T-Pouched Guild. We put the do in overdose. Criminal background? No problem. Whatever you got arrested for doing, I'll pay you to do it. Well, I say pay. It's a very complicated system of compensation that uh, puts the very in slavery. Uh... Well, he got one, which I suppose is within the margin of error for the prediction of zero. With the rest of the miners liberated, the guild carried on northeast, passing through a big rocky arch and down a hill towards a wide river. This river was something rather special. Around it, the ground was covered in yellowish mosses, with bushes and trees springing up from it here and there. The waterway snaked north through canyons and valleys, creating a colourful band of life amidst the arid wastes. Yet, unlike the Great Swamp, this lively scene wasn't one that plunged you to your death with a single misstep, or one that seared off your skin at the merest touch. No, this place was the one spot on the unfinished planet that was suitable for civilization. Too bad it was the Holy Nation who had lain claim to it. The Promised Land. There's no end to it, Sandor muttered. To think the Holy Nation has such bountiful territories. Why are they not cultivated? Wadston asked. Easy, Pia said. They got an old policy. Only make enough food for those above the rank of servant. Slaves can't get strong without food, and they can't even steal food if it doesn't exist. 
Works like a charm, huh? Since those faggin' nobles think reproducing is as good as getting biobashed by the robos, they don't really need that much food. So thousands of years are nothing out here in the only place people can actually stand. Good news for the river raptors, I guess. It's just one gorilla shit thing after another with these holy hogs, Nuke said. Right, see that place over there? We're gonna conquer the shit out of it and grow wheat by the river. Let's get this bread. A noble plan, but there was a big problem. The bread was already firmly in the hands of another. As the guild walked up the road towards the Holy Nation market town of Bad Teeth, two companies of Shek soldiers came down it the other way. Their carefully spaced formations stomped to a halt and drew their weapons upon seeing the horrible sight of the skimmer ball, but Isaiah rushed forward to explain the situation. Almost at once, the Shek bowed to their prince. Isaiah Battleborn, you honor us, their leader said. We can never be forgiven for stealing this honor from you. Please, punish us at once. Is it all done? How did you get there anyway? Isaiah said. Queen Astarta is no fool. She will not let the Sheik Kingdom be idle in this time of war. We have done what needs to be done. But if we had known that you sought that pleasure yourself, we would never have dared. Oh, that's fine. I'm tired of lugging these beasts around anyway. Everyone, seems we've been out shacked here. Indeed, these soldiers had shacked bad teeth bottom to top. The holy garrison was long gone, the statue of the holy phoenix beside the main thoroughfare was eating sand, and shek merchants were already unloading garus to set up shop. That saves time. Rather than battle then, the guild got to rest up within guarded walls and get first dibs on choco bread supply contracts. But the anticlimax would not do, especially for the Thousand Guardians, so the next morning they wandered on to the northeast yet further. The mountains gave way to a grey plain littered with struggling little trees, and across this there was a Holy Nation fortification. This too was no fun, as it had already been abandoned. The nation was shrinking rapidly, and big old Okran up in the sky seemed as disinterested as ever. Where had the devotees gone wrong? Too much cleavage? Not enough? Okran's will was a mystery. Indeed, he kept his cards close to his otherwise unclothed chest. On the northwest edge of that dull expanse, there was a large fortification built around a big sandstone tower. It was a mining complex and military way station, crawling with slavers, guards, and would-be hemp haberdashers. I say would-be. As usual, after the guild suddenly rolled in and broke open the slave pens, they came off a little too weird, scary, stinky, and other meaner adjectives. But just think about it, this is your chance to start a new life like these guys, Nuke claimed, pointing out at the homunculus. It's very warm inside the ball, he added. Again, he somehow got one taker, but perhaps that was some mistake. Then again, the degeneracy parasite works in mysterious ways. Now, so far it had been another mine and dash affair, but this time the Naish had a secret weapon. While the guild was milling about waiting to leave, a voice echoed out from the hills the mine sat astride. Hark! Who dares defy the milky face of Ocran? Let's see how you like a taste of your own medicine. Or should I say, Dedison? Me! <laughs> ba! Ba! Squa! Those final noises came across like bird calls, and with that, silence returned. That's a niche accent. Is Rickard doing another show? Isaiah asked. No idea. Maybe we better wrap the product recalling up fast, Izumi said. But it was already too late. The ground started to shake. The camp gate rattled and the prisoner cages shuddered. From outside, a stampede of bulls stormed up the road from the west and rammed their way into the mine. Now that's some bull sheared, Rick quipped as he was sent reeling to the ground. For the lightweight humans, the impacts did more than just knock them over. The chaos released and awoke many a skimmer, and quickly the two species were battling, horn to tooth. These creatures have been befouled, a simulated association, was Gustafsson's analysis, given just before he was launched over the mine wall. Unworthy! 
his fading voice called as he went. Shid, have they got our secrets? Yuke said. Impossible. Only we know. Wait. Agent Hammer. What if he's some kind of spy? Izumi said. You mean, like an agent? Oh, shit. This is terrible. Not really. The skimmers will deal with it. No, I mean, I've been such an idiot. That machine was using me. You are very useful. Now is not the time, Nuke. Let me know when it is. Fucking hells. Let's just stay alive. If you insist. The Battle of the Beasts went in the guild's favor, luckily enough. But it was no clean victory. Bulls are heavy and their horns are sharp, so the mine had to be turned into an impromptu hospital and skimmer rescue center to fulfill Princess Azumi's stay alive stratagem. Thought you said I'd be safe if I stick with you, Twitch said to Rick. Yeah, we got all kinds of dumbass shit going on here, but it's perfectly safe, Rick replied, finishing the reapplication of his squishy chest pudge. Don't worry too much, Twitchy. It's helping us out, you know, Neil said. And is killing fleshies, which apparently is going out of fashion, so we gotta make the most of this last century. Aye, I heard ya, but I've been making the most of the last 2k, and the most I got was a beating from a Spider-Man and a ban from the city. Shoulda stayed with you, sir. Nah, being on the road makes things easy. Get stuck in a cage like Agnew, and you can't help but think about stuff. Trust me, you got it made, man. Take your word for it, you flesh-wearing freak. Sometime in the afternoon of the following day, St. Charlie's Hospital for Skimmed Skimmers and Dr. Watson's No Credit, Yes Problem Triage and Debt Structuring Clinic were closed, and the guild carried on their campaign. They went northeast towards the Empire, and found two of the hopeless slaves released the previous day now willing to join the Skimball Collective to get some of that advertised warmth. With more feet meat on the beat, they carried on. Ahead of them there was a gravelly hill with a plateau on top, and on top of that, a big Second Empire tower. Its base was ringed with walls and Holy Nation patrols. Military base, but what's that Second Empire thing? Okran hates that stuff, right? Izumi said. Yeah, well people don't always tell the truth, especially about what Okran does or don't hate, Pia said. Could it be that they are protecting that facility from their own people? Wadston suggested. Just blow it up then, Nuke said. Not if they believe their own waffle, Izumi said. Never known a waffle to lie. They probably don't dare go inside, but someone sometime decided that whatever's actually in there must never be seen. So you know what that means? It must be seen, Isaiah cheered. Pretty much. Hunters, we've got another job. Wait, Izzy, gotta get through the hogs first. And that's a job for Commander Egg's Grubby Friends Battalion. Dinner time! Els called, and at once the skimmer ball writhed to life, its carriers fleeing and cringing with equal intensity. While the skimmers scratched their way up the hillside for a warm-up, Wadston geared up in his trident-tested Holy Nation disguise to gather intel. Just like at Stack, when he walked up to the fort's gates, the guards were delighted to hear that no one was worried about anything in particular. The old gentleman hence noted down the rows of barrack houses, tall watchtowers, racks of weapons and armor, and absence of any common folk. It was indeed a military base, quite the hassle to break into, but would it be worth it? To know, Wadston had to check the Second Empire Tower out. The soldiers had locked the gate leading up to it, but that didn't make too much difference at the end of the day. It was 1am by the way, so the timing was perfect. Oh mate, not trying to break into the Tower of Unholy Secrets are ya? A guard called out. No worries, Wadston replied with a gleaming smile. Nah, just checking the locks aren't ya? Course, <laughs> true blue. Now where was I? Uh, send me through time, whatever, it's all fine, but I'm gonna keep my junk, alright? As the guard wandered off into the rainy night, singing away, Wadston edged the gate open and slipped over to check these unholy secrets. Proof that the Naish hadn't been in there was forthcoming, as the tower was guarded by security spiders. That doubled as proof that the good stuff was surely waiting deeper inside. Seeing that his crimes were not generating any worries thus far, Wadston decided to pull a cheeky one. Back outside, the skimmers were hissing away just beyond the reach of the lights along the walls. 
Wadston went out, tapped two of them to follow him, and then led them right back to the gate. I asked you again. What are these two hivers? the guard asked. Well, you already know what Wadston said in response, and you already know the extent to which Wadston was let inside the fort with two bloodthirsty skimmers in tow. He was about to go back to get more, but he made one crucial mistake. You see, in the meantime, he hid the skimmers in a little shed towards the rear, but then as he went to leave, a guard saw him coming out of the shed with two purring beasts inside, and assumed the worst. Succubi! Seductress creatures! Fug! Give me a fucking gal! I mean, fug! Kill them or something! This call raised the alarm. Wadston had to act fast. He pulled a loaf of brown from his bag, crumbled it up in his hands, then tossed a cloud of crumbs into the air. The night wind took their scent and drew it all around, flaring the nostrils of all nearby skimmers and Shek. Before the Naish knew it, their little base was being swarmed with unholy creatures, and those so-called succubi were a little rough, to put it lightly. Armoured men poured out of the barrack houses, then poured back in, shrieking loudly, then found ways to shriek even louder when it turned out some of the skimmers could just about squeeze through the doors and get inside. And to make matters worse, these smaller skim friends were the femoid ones. Those that avoided death at the hands of Makase or Nadeshko still ended up in a similar situation at the less metaphorical hands of the Thousand Guardians, and indeed the rest of the guild who filed into the fray behind them. At one point, a guard managed to single out poor Beep and threw her against a wall. Fagin filthy bags, you'll get what's coming to ya! He raged, but then there was a whistle and a two-foot bolt of metal rammed through the back of his head. The only thing that's coming is me, Gustafsson shouted. The guard fell, and Beep saw the prince standing with his long four-armed crossbow hanging at his waist. Beep, I'm so glad you are coming, Beep said. It's only with your help that I can achieve this, Gustafsson nodded. Fucking, ugh, Nuke moaned nearby, rushing off to find something to stab. By morning, the base was subdued with a few surviving Ocranites chained up in their barracks. Taking out nation troops is good and all, but the actual fight was the one that followed, as Azaya led the Guardians to clear the tower of its spider problem. Handily, only a few were still active. Clearly some had been dispatched by overly curious Naish folk in the past. The place was full of the usual useful machinery and salvage, but the biggest prize was in a library on the top floor. Narco's nose ring? No, Ocran's bloody bolts! This stuff is from over a thousand years ago, the beginning of the Holy Nation! Izumi shouted. And here we are at the end, how poetic, Nuke said. Look, it's the Second Empire talking about the worshippers of Bokren, the spirit of, uh, of, of Earth. Wait, you say Bargran? Rick said. No, Bokran. Well, about the time I was shipped out, some of the humans had this dumb thing about pretending to worship this guy, Bargran, which was like this general name for Earth Clan people. Just doing it to piss us off, always doing that shit during the Stope memorials. This whole thing, guess it's just that, but weirder. Dozen centuries will do that. This is amazing. We can use this to agitate the whole Naish, Pia said. Can you get this all written up real easy to read, Princess? I guess. Are people just going to unironically call me Princess now, by the way? Izumi said. Of course, Your Majesty! Wadston was quick to reply. Fine. Yes, we have to get this written up. All this directly proves that the Holy Fire is wrong. Holy Fire? Nuke asked. It's their book. You must have seen it. Words only book. Yes, all their people have them. They're in every room, on every corpse. Words only, though, so... sorry. It's their whole basis for believing stuff. It says that Ocran created the world when he and his cat-human thing... Actually, it was clearly inspired by the classics, which makes sense if it was written during the withdrawal of the Second Empire. Holy fire. More like, holy liar! Nuke burst out. No one really reacted, but at least they had a title for their agitprop now. Holy phoenix? More like... Jabroni Kleenex, Rick attempted. 
What? I weren't programmed for comedy. Which makes the other stuff I say even funnier. Now let's just get back to the printing presses and start laundering blasphemy on an industrial scale, huh? It was a fine idea. So the guild gathered up all kinds of nice evidence on the transition from Second Empire rule to Holy Nation Ascendancy, including all the spicy details on how it was all, to quote one ancient report, just a prank, and went on their way. The plan was to head vaguely east to get back into the Empire, but as it happened, the Holy Nation had another High Inquisitor, who was not only very unhappy with the whole Setter affair, but had an army waiting on the road the guild needed to take. They'd have to fight their way out of the decreasingly Holy Nation, in the name of truth, or at the very least, the name of comedy. The decisive battle was nigh. Country Road, daily go, to the place where I belong, Black Desert City, Meramah, Country Road, take me home. The skeleton sang, although Agnew wasn't contributing much to the melody. The road they were on actually did eventually curve its way into the Iron Valleys and through to the Deadlands, so they had the right idea. Problem was that well before that, it went through a narrow pass packed with angry hogs. Holy hogs, that is. Holy Nation soldiers, that is. They were arrayed on the road, flanked by two forts that closely overshadowed the only route through the awe-streaked igneous cliffs that marked the edge of the Holy Nation. Charlie, magic hands time, Nuke said, which in one way or another led to the skimmers being roused from their sucrose slumber. Careful with that, hold it sideways or the oil will leak out, Izumi scolded Nuke's new employees. The freed slaves from the mines were jointly lugging one of the security spiders the guild had bested recently. A true tech hunter uses every part of the kill, after all, even the brain. This thing is as dumb as a dveg, Enrico reported from within the spider. You won't get any use out of it. No voyeur would stoop to cameras this blurry. Shut up, Enrico. I know your scheme with Agent Hammer. And yet you get changed beside it anyway. At this point, I think it's your fault. I know you've been feeding information to the Phoenix. Admit it. You are quite delusional. And you are an intellectual turncoat, turnkey, and... and... Turn off? Nuke suggested. Alas, that his processes were less clogged, he would treat you as you deserve, fleshy princess. Hammer's voice said. Oh, not you as well. We can't all be in here, Enrico complained. All? Who else is listening in there, you dusty creep? Izumi demanded. Ah, the questions, the questions. Can't we all just get along? I mean, we all agree on one thing, don't we? That Okren isn't real? Okren isn't real? Okren isn't fucking real? And Narco is the best waifu? Enrico bellowed. The buzzy words echoed around the sun-baked cliffs. Oh, you little shit, Izumi said, grabbing her whacking pole but don't get too excited. Shouts and stomps approached rapidly. The Holy Nation troops were upon them. Got a waifu? Lose your laifu, one shouted. What the fuck? Skimmers got through, he added. I should note that this fortified pass led through to the skim sands, which was quite the force for peace, as the Ocranites didn't want to invade it, and the Empire didn't want to patrol it. Thus, the two sides never caught wind of each other. Attempts to establish a de zone had failed, and so Operation Skim to Stalemate had been going on for a good century. It took a genius such as Nuke to realise that victory required that your operation name at least half rhyme. Alliteration wasn't apt to add absolutely any avail. In other words, the skimmers killed the Holy Nation soldiers. After the mess was cleared up, they still had the matter of fort walls lined with archers to deal with. I have a present for you, princess, Hammer said as the guild sized up the situation. Not now! Where's the volume control on these damn spiders? Izumi replied. Oh, you'll want to hear this. I have a map of the enemy base. Here, look into this poor creature's eyes and you'll see it. Bullshit! I'll do it. 
Nuke said, grabbing the spider and sticking it in his face. Not my precise tastes, but I'm a modern machine. Let's dance. Here, the gates to their fort, and the password, if you like. That seems kind of legit. Nice. How do you have this? A gift, an apology from a mutual friend. It was pretty suspicious, but the map checked out from what they could tell. It was possible, it seemed, to get inside the fort about halfway down the Gauntlet of Archers, at which point they could hit the walls and secure safe passage. But to win once they got inside, they needed the skimmers to make it in. The approach will not be easy, Hammer explained. You're required to maneuver straight down this trench and skim the surface to this point. The target area is only two meters wide. The voice sounded a little strange, but that was the least of the guild's concerns. The gates are only two meters. That's impossible, even for bloody elves, Elena said. I got the skimmers to go in the labs back at the last fun party. They weren't much bigger than two meters. Nice labs they were. Els said. So, a plan was hatched. As fortune would have it, the trench run was quite easy on account of a stir at the gates around two in the morning. You see anything out there? Sandor said to Nuke. Nope. Exactly. Attack now! That's some abstract ass strategy advice. But I guess I'm bored of waiting. Punch it, Charlie! The skimmers, who had been carefully briefed on the operation by their wrangler, were released. They raced for the gates, and found that indeed what Nuke couldn't see really was helping. That is to say, the gate guards were entangled with a gang of barely visible ninja. Even Okrin casts a shadow, Sandor quipped. He'd probably been waiting to say that for a while. Regardless, the guild followed along behind the skim squadron, and using a little force, they got the skimmers in through one of the fort gates. The walls were swept clean of defenders as easily as a skimmer dusts sand over its eggs, and the remaining troops hanging around the barracks didn't do much better. After a good hour, one side of the road was secure, and it was likely safe to carry on home. But from the adjoining fort, a voice boomed. You slimy fag nuggets! Ochrin's pisters are ruining offie with ya, you credit managing fags! Prepare to face the wrath of me, Big Stick Valtena! Shit, sounds like we better compare sticks right away, Rick said. That's the High Inquisitor, the other one, Pierre explained. He must be the biggest billy in the nation after Seda. Then let's go cut him and his stick down to size, Nuke said. You's obsessed with sticks out here. Was it always like this? Twitch asked. Sir Twitch, so naive. You can't have read the classics, can you? Isaiah said, before joining the skimmers in a trip across the road into Fort 2, the Inquisition didn't expect you. As night turned to morning, this additional battle proved to be more involved than the first, as the Inquisition were elite warriors. Clearly their particular style of questioning had just so happened to lead to a fair few fights. Now, being an elite warrior doesn't help all that much when you're being eaten by a beast the size of a building, but the much-talked-about sticks wielded by these hogs were indeed rather long. Many of the skimmers got seriously sliced in the fray and had to be dragged away by their ovular master. In the hours-long grind, many guild members got similar treatment, but with the fort's garrison withering away, High Inquisitor Valtena couldn't last forever. At long last, he slumped over backwards and into Nuke's arms. Fuck! You're strong and sharp. That scent, so sweet, so forbidden. Don't matter if you're a little older than me, Valtena muttered as his vision failed him. Ah, well, wait till you learn the truth about that one. Stirred up my girlfriend, that's for sure, Nuke said. Girl? Friend? Ochran? How can you tease me like this? And with this devastating disappointment, Valtena's dream of meeting hot singles in his area was extinguished. But don't feel too bad for him. The jails of the Empire had plenty of what he was looking for too. With his defeat, the fort of Ochran's shield had been captured, 
and the road to the United Cities lay open to all. The guild wouldn't be using it anytime soon, on account of their various immobilizing injuries. Doc Wadston went around giving out free samples of his services, and the tech hunters knew a few things about cleaning wounds these days. I don't really get it. Let's put it this way, what kind of swimsuit would a bacteria wear? Nuke asked Izumi. No, they don't wear anything, Izumi claimed. Now that's degenerate. Wait, gas girl and bacteria boy, what a pairing! With this, Nuke went to discuss important academic matters with the mangaka class. Well, if it was a way to educate the world on the importance of hygiene, then Bacteria Boy's infectious charm and hardy disposition was just what everyone needed. And if you couldn't get enough of him, just wait until you learn about self-replication. Not everyone was in such high spirits. Amid the chaos of battle, poor Beep had been upended by a Naish greatsword and was now down to one leg. When Gustafsson found her, he gasped and rushed to her side. It is gone, he said. Oh no, Beep, Beep said. This is brilliant. Oh yes, Beep. The transformation is beginning already. The mortal matter is shed. At last you will ascend to be a timeless machine like a true queen. Beep. Yes, Beep. But Prince, I cannot walk. This is your destiny. Now you must ride me. Oh, I'm so happy you want me to ride you. Beep. They ain't even playing Wacky BG, and the freakier than Fleshy Fridays down at the Stimulus Center. Neil commented. Don't worry, degeneracy parasite, theory goes. Innuendo inoculations in development, Rick assured him. Gustafsson hauled Beep over his shoulder and went to hum and hiss at his fellow hivers strewn across the field. While everyone else was preparing to leave, Izumi got back to business with the overly sentient Spider-Bot. You think this gets you off the hook? She said. Oh, you're back. Did it go well? I was right, wasn't I? You could at least thank me, Enrico said. Thank you, huh? It wasn't you who got those plans, was it? Oh? If it wasn't me, then who? In this day and age, who can say? Perhaps it was those superluminal millipedes. Izumi posited cynically. That would explain everything. It all hits. A new voice said from the spider. Professor Eo, I knew you were in there. Whoops. Sorry, Enrico, baby. I got too excited. Don't worry, sweet chips. Happens to me all the time. Enrico said. Eo, did you tell the Neige how to tame monsters? You leaked our choco bread recipe, didn't you? Izumi asked. Yeah. No problem, right? Science is for everyone. Eo said. No, that was my science! I went through more shit than you can imagine getting on my data, and I won't have you and your Deutsch dog just giving it away! What is this nonsense? Your science? Enrico shot back. We are talking about knowledge that can save this shitty planet, and you think that you are the only one who gets to do anything with it? You aren't so special, princess. I could have made those discoveries too if I had an army of underpaid drug addicts at my disposal! I bet even this stuttering screensaver Eo could have done it! Get over yourself before we start building the Azumi was on Total Swinehund Memorial Hospitals and all that shit! This is science, not the game of empires your stupid friends are playing! Azumi was speechless in the face of this scolding, yet feeling she had to say something, replied, My friends aren't stupid. Let's leave it, Enrico. The call was over, and so soon was the guild's stay in that bloodied fort. They set off home in the afternoon, Valtenner in tow, but there was yet another voice echoing around the cliffs. I say voice, but it was more a series of screeching sounds with an electronic texture, as if made by a skeleton. You'll see what machines do to us, you fools! Scream! It eventually said, before returning to a few more weird noises, then cutting out. Holy Nation is a strange place. Isaiah commented, but actually there was something to all this. A second empire spider soldier emerged from behind some rocks and charged the guild. Is that... It's obeying that voice, Elena said. They can control the robots too now? We gotta kill them faster, man, Nuke said, drawing his sword. 
Luckily, the whole guild was trained in the tuck and twist technique, so the spider was deactivated in short order. It was then added to the pile of junk the guild was dragging behind them as they set off into the desert. They spent the night encamped under the starry sky, and the next morning pressed on into the Empire, next coming to a halt at Trader's Edge. There, the hefty bounty on Valtena could be collected in full. Incredible work, Prince Tashino. The Empire salutes you, the samurai captain working the front desk at the police station said. In that case, you want to do me a favor, Nuke said. I'm at your command, your highness. Nice. Well, you see, a while back I got into some shit around here. Me and my friends got picked up by those damn manhunters, and we went through a whole thing that was generally shit. Those bastards are probably still here, so my order to you is round them up and throw them in with the hog. The samurai did not hesitate. He grabbed some troops, went outside to the gate to where the local manhunter crew were staking out passers-by on the main road, and gave them a good old-fashioned roughing up. The guild were all too happy to help drag what remained back to be thrown into the jail. Shit, that felt good. I forget that I'm, like, in charge of all this sometimes," Nuke said. Only because you've earned it, Prince Tashino, Isaiah said. And now you're putting that power to good use. I wonder if those animals will get bought up by their comrades. That might change their mind about the whole thing, eh? Speaking of changing minds, let's get back to the lab soon, Izumi said. Once we get the truth about the Holy Nation printed up, we can silence those Ocranites for good. Yep, we're rolling out, Nuke said. And as a special treat, let's leave the Scroops here. I've ordered the Samurai to take good care of them. About time people started getting to know the heroes of the Empire. Thus the Skimmers were left to liaise with the terrified citizenry, while the Guild finally plodded on home. Aside from the publication of deets on the social experiment gone wrong, gone sexual, that was the Holy Nation, there were lots of things to attend to. Gustafsson, for example, was quick to gather up his posse in the barracks, where he dug through the guild's disorganized piles of junk until a treasure was unearthed. Link! he proclaimed, echoed by a chorus from his followers. He held aloft an old robot leg, which he promptly affixed to Beep's hip. It was quite a lot shorter than her remaining natural leg, but she seemed delighted with it all the same. Now I can practice my Beep even more! Beep! she said. This was, apparently, a good thing. While this was going on, Azumi was having words with Agent Hammer. You slimy fug, did you tell Enrico or Eo how to get spiders to attack people? Ah, uh, I thought you would be impressed that I worked it out. The data was all here. Yes, I did inform Enrico, for it all needs to be archived. We needn't go over his little outburst about the commons of science, need we? But he let the Holy Nation have that, and they sent a spider to attack us. Maybe you could keep your ports shut for a while before you go giving our enemies dangerous weapons. My ports open and shut at your command, my lady. I'll make it up to you. Oh, but on the subject of dangerous weapons, you did collect those uranium samples, didn't you? Yeah, Nuke smoked some of it, but we've got it. Fascinating. He was made for you, darling. Now, let's make you Queen of the Spiders, shall we? By that, he apparently meant that he was going to reveal how to reprogram old spider bots, which could be tested at once on the spiders the guild had hauled home from their adventure. All right, plug me in, Rick said. Yes, the process required that one of the skeletons be used as a peripheral to the spiders. The Mangaka class sat on the stairs on the tower where the spiders were being stored, sketchbooks in hand. The plug, by the way, was wireless, but drawing abstract, mostly invisible things was the class's foremost skill. Oh man, these spiders hate humans! Damn! Look at all these logs! You racist, man! You real racist, even for a machine that kills folk based on the race! Rick commented. All right, Rick, you ready for the injection? Izumi asked. The artist's corrupted eyes were positively glowing, but this turned out to be referring to a code injection. It wiped the spiders clean, then poured new material into their heads. Electronically and invisibly, you understand. Basically, the spiders were to life and didn't kill everyone, so that's pretty much mission accomplished. 
That AI actually did it, Yuzumi commented to Nuke. Well, that's its thing. But it was meant to be my thing. Guess if I listen to them and forget about it, I don't need to feel bad, huh? Not like we're going to forget all this is happening because of you, is he? It's not just me. They were right. I mean, it's you as well. Well, if it is, that's cool. Yeah. I should be more like you. I should be doing this because it's for the good of everyone. Uh, I'm doing this because my dad kicked me out for being too high at the dinner table. Oh yeah. I'm glad he did that then. <laughs> man, so am I. Let's chill out for a bit, huh? Sure, but what about the spiders? They'll be fine. Here, do you know why this green is glowing these days? Outside, the spiders were having fun stamping on Rick's tin humanoid figurines. Guess I missed something, but that's close enough, Rick shrugged. Thus, the guild had some spiders to help them out around the farm, which was quite appropriate, as the whole Spiderbot line was originally manufactured for just such purposes, with all kinds of attachments fitting on their long arms, and little spray nozzles for fertilizer lining their underside. Once you tell them that the fertilizer isn't to be made from human corpses, they become rather handy machines. More handy machines were on the way. Decoding of second and even some first Empire data was unveiling new marvels to test out. The latest project was coal mining to be used in steel firing. Such things were all vital components of the ultimate research project that Agent Hammer had in mind, although he hadn't revealed the full nature of that to his fleshy work hands. Nuke was regularly up in black scratch, trying to get people addicted to either green or brown, so that he could get a steady supply of the parts they dug up. Thus, Manx and Canyon gradually accumulated both the knowledge and the means to change the world. They didn't plan to stay for long, as the skimmers were eagerly awaiting their return, as was the Holy Phoenix. They stayed only as long as it took to build an enormous boring machine that could drill down into the Mankey riverbed, revealing veins of chalky sediments below. All very uninteresting, but when the first samples were hauled up for analysis, Gustafsson came bounding over. This is it, he said, grabbing some of the wet gravel and smearing it on his face. He wordlessly worked to cover his entire body, while the others watched with a mix of embarrassment and fascination. Once he was fully coated in the whitish paste, he turned to them and said, The time has come. Whatever was this about? We'll get back to it. It's not all that much weirder than it was already, I assure you. And if Gustafsson's creepy business could be swiftly concluded, the showdown with what remained of the Holy Nation awaited.